I finished my noodles. I'm ready to get back to Silent Hill 3. And uh, yeah, we're coming up on the nine hour mark, <laughs> which is how long I thought this whole playthrough was going to take. And we're about halfway through the game. So uh, I really need to kind of pick things up and go a little bit quicker. I'm going to be a little bit more selective about some of the things that I stop and look at and read and discuss. You should know by now. Also, that's loud as fuck. It is... Did I change... Change this. Turn that back down. That should hopefully be a bit better. No, that's still very loud. Why did the audio change? Think that will be okay? I need to go back into the very loud room and see how loud that is on the mixer. Is this better? Ah, uh, is it better? It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Louder. Okay. It looks all right on the mixer. <laughs> Luckily, you know, this is always kind of a hard game to get the audio and stuff like nice and balanced for because there's just, uh, there's so much. There's it's such quiet parts followed by such loud parts. It's hard to find a nice, nice medium where everything sounds okay for the whole playthrough. There are photos hung here. Maybe the locker owner's lover. Maybe. Almost look at that. That photo. Hey, Empress. How can you go for that many hours without getting tired? Uh, practice. Practice and experience. I used to, uh, just do lots of streaming. I've been streaming Silent Hill since like 2015, January 2015. And uh, I get used to doing long streams when I was very, very first building up the, the channel in, in that er those early years. I would do like, um, you know, 10 hour stream, 12 hour stream. It eventually became 24 hour streams that I did every once in a while. And then it became 24 hour streams that I do every two weeks and I would just get used to prepping for them and uh, making sure to have like drinks. I'm, I'm actually a lot better about it now than I used to be. I would just sit down and power through with, uh, you know, nothing really. I'd, I'd almost never take breaks. When I did take breaks, they were not like the one I just took where I actually take a break. Uh, I would just hurry through and uh, do my thing and just stay up super late and do like 24 hours in one sitting with like barely any breaks. Sometimes none. Yeah, just a lot of practice, practice streaming, practice staying up and and streaming at the same time. Because it's one thing to just like stay up for twenty four hours. It's another thing to stay up and do one thing for twenty four hours, like just play a game. Um, and it's another thing entirely to do all that while also reading chat and talking to people, answering questions, remembering trivia, and trying to do like a playthrough on top of it. So. Yeah. Stuff that takes a while. Desk is all cluttered up. Doesn't look like there's anything I'm interested in. Same radio model? It is. 
Good eye is the same radio that we saw in the the trash. It's another one that comes from uh, Silent Hill Two. Doors open just a smidge. Must be rusted or something. I can't pull it out any further. But there's our puzzle. We need to open that one. Do you have a question, but I'm kind of shy to ask? I mean, go for it. If it's something that I absolutely refuse to answer, I all I'll do is mock you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll, I'll be nice. My cat is so sad right now. He is meowing at my door because I've been streaming for a long time and he just, uh, he's too much trouble when he's in here while I'm streaming. So I got to keep the door closed and he is not happy about it. I was wondering if you have another job except streaming. I have had other jobs on and off while streaming. Uh, right now, streaming is like my only real main thing. I guess technically I'm a a caretaker at, a, an, at an old folks retirement community. If we want to count that on top of what I'm doing right now. But I don't really do a whole lot. I'm mostly just taking care of like my own mom. Screwdriver. But um, when I first started streaming, um, I was a musician. That's what I was doing on top of streaming. Uh, I was a studio musician. So go in a studio, work with producer, record uh, piano or guitar for bands that needed it, sometimes record uh, some of uh, my own music. But yeah, it was a lot of helping other musicians uh, record what they needed, audio production. So I did that for year, a few years. A couple other random things, doing like pizza delivery. <laughs> And stuff like that. Uh, game over, Gandhi. Thank you so much for the bits. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah. It's katana time. This is a short katana about two feet long. Pretty powerful and easy to handle. However, it's not as good as the Silent Hill 1 katana. No whoosh percent. <laughs> Harry Mason, he swings that katana, he moves forward. Heather, feet perfectly planted on the ground, no forward momentum, no whoosh percent. We'll kill some things with it. Heather doesn't know how to use a sword. She puts the pointy end in the monster. Okay? I'm sorry she's not Dante from the Devil May Cry series. definitely not Virgil. He's not even motivated. Got a jack. Oil and foil and stuff like that. 
Can't use any of it. That is straight up Texaco brand motor oil. Got the logo down there and everything. They definitely didn't get permission for that. Just like with Shell and Silent Hill 1, at least with the Shell station, it was still called Shell, but they changed the logo. Yeah, the S was kind of fuzzed out, so it looked like it said hell. So there was a little bit, it was a little bit hidden. Although when we were doing the uh, Silent Hill one on Duck Station with all the all the uprezzed graphics, you could very easy you could very legibly make out the brand on the bottom of the lighter that just said Zippo. So there was that. kind of poster looks like there will be a performance soon Ooh. screwdriver this flathead screwdriver was in a corner of the hallway totally ordinary and good for prying open drawers When his right mind puts monitors on top of computers. <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty commonplace. Uh back then. I definitely agree with you. Like nowadays it's kind of a like thing that would that I would never want to do again. But that was how uh that was how a lot of a lot of places set up their their computers. A lot of people set their computers up that way. Rope in an office. Oh Jesus. I don't know if I'd go that far, trouser guy. This is in a drawer at the office. It looks sturdy and well used. Get a lot of use out of that rope. The car jack. You use this to raise a car when you need to change a tire or something. Standard office equipment rope. Yep. That's the, uh... The OSHA rope that they put there for emergencies. We can go downstairs. Ugh, what a bother to climb up that rope. I'm going to look around this floor for now. <laughs> I love when you try to do something that in reality Heather could do, and she's just like, ugh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> It's like, oh, there's a key under this pallet that's got boxes on top of it. It's like, you could just move those boxes and pick the key up. And it's like, that's way too much work. I'd rather wander around the mall until I find some tongs. Hey, we've got text for save points again. That old familiar pattern is on a piece of paper stuck to the vending machine. Who the hell put it there? Game over, Gandhi. Thank you for that, Hezabimu. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, it's not like it's the latest fad or anything, right? Yeah, the latest fad. Everyone's just super into, oh, excuse me, super into cult symbols, halo of the sun. They're just putting it everywhere. The cult member taping that symbol on a fucking vending machine would be a good view. Yeah, seriously. I want to see Claudia coming through here and being like, this would be a good spot. She takes out the masking tape from her cloak. From her, like, robe. Beef jerky. Dalmatians. A dog figurine. Looks real enough to bite. Uh, so earlier, when I was on break there, I played uh, a little short music video called Usagi that uh, Team Silent made. It's a little short about a bunch of Robbies. Robbie the Rabbit mascots in a hospital. Hello, game. Can I tab out? Thank you. Um... And I mentioned that that was from a uh, a DVD that went around. Called Lost Memories, The Art and Music of Silent Hill. And the cover of that DVD is from this room. They used this room to make the shot uh, of the cover of it. You can see uh, it's just like Heather in her idle pose. Those Dalmatians down in the corner. Uh, just with a custom you know, overhead camera angle. They cheated. It's their game. That's the real cam hack. When you just are the person who made the camera and can do whatever you want. Yeah, the dogs are facing different directions. Because they can do that too. Is Heather the only character who makes so many remarks on the non-interactive items? Uh, yeah, for sure. Out of the whole, like, series, Heather comments way more than any other protagonist on uh, just things in the environment. Just a bed. Nobody is hiding under the covers. You're expecting somebody to be hiding under there? Are you at uh, the point where you're just expecting weird shit to be happening? I mean, after the day that she's had so far, like, pretty much be expecting, like, anything. People under the bed, hiding under the covers, monsters doing things, showing up out of nowhere. A bathtub display. There's a dark red stain on the bottom. Yuck. Oh, 
I knew it. being invaded by the other world, by a world of someone's nightmarish delusions come to life. So there's another one of our segments where the original voice acting is missing. Sadly, I can only really do a good Harry Mason <laughs> impression. Not all the characters, otherwise I would just put the audio back in myself, just dub it all. Now the world changes. We we turned the valve. And valve turning is another one of those, like, recurring themes in this game. We're about to meet one of the cult's deities named Valtiel, who is supposed to essentially be the caretaker for the Mother of God. And Valtiel is often seen rotating a valve in transitionary moments throughout the game where you're going from, you know, real world into real world very much affected by the other world. So <clears throat> once that sort of starts happening, you start seeing those valves turning. Um, a lot of that is symbolic of just kind of the cyclical nature of going back and forth to the other world and kind of the normal world. Not to mention the reincarnation cycle, where this is Heather's third life. She's lived as Alessa, she's lived as Cheryl, she's reincarnated, lives as Heather. So, that spinning as our trigger into getting into the other world here makes a little bit more sense with a lot of the themes. Where are these gods from? Are they demons? That's kind of a tough question to answer, Big Strawberry, because there's a few different ways that, that fans kind of talk about this, and there is no concrete answer in the series. Um, it's explained that there is a spiritual power that just exists in the area of Silent Hill, um, so they could be gods or demons or deities or whatever that inhabit that area and actually exist, uh, which is what a lot of fans believe. I have kind of a different belief. I'm on the other side of the fence where the spiritual power of Silent Hill has the ability to take what is in your mind and make it real. So if you've got a bunch of crazy cultists who believe in these gods and demons and deities, while they're in the influence of this town and its power, the, the power will make those gods real. It makes their beliefs real because it's what's in their head. Oh. got to talk about Marilyn Monroe. So there's uh, tweets about uh, this in particular and interviews about this in particular with some of the uh, developers. Uh, Masahiro Ito describes this visual 
of the laughing bloody mouth and the two ears, bleeding ears on either side as being representative of Alessa. Uh, the laughing mouth and bleeding ears supposed to be the shrieking insanity of Alessa as it was described. The loss of sanity of Alessa over time. So even though Alessa has been reincarnated as Heather, an element of her sort of still exists. Her memory still exists and has been becoming more and more insane over this this period of time in the 17 years between the events of Silent Hill 1 and now. And eventually it comes to an actual confrontation between Heather and her memory of Alessa. The boss is literally called Memory of Alessa. So this is supposed to be that sort of representation. And uh, as for the mouth itself, a lot of people cited that this was from the Silent Hill 1 soundtrack, that this was Lisa's voice or Lisa's mouth, because it is kind of similar to a soundtrack cover for Silent Hill 1. But here's the thing, it's not, and I'll show you. So that is the album cover in question. Even if we kind of try to flip it there. Totally different. Completely different mouth, completely different render, different pose, everything. So, similar enough where I can see how uh, fans would make that assumption, especially if they already have the Silent Hill soundtrack, and they're like, hey, that kind of looks like this. Here instead, I present Marilyn Monroe. that a little better. Much closer. To the point where you can see that the one, the final one used in game is digitally altered. They removed her nostrils slightly changed it. But look at that. Just a neat neat thing, kind of figuring out the source for it. Yeah, they liquefied the upper lip, edited the nostrils, some little minor alterations and stuff on it, but that looks like either the base image that was edited for it, or the, uh, inspiration behind them doing a render of it that's incredibly, incredibly close. The mummy-like thing in a wheelchair is just a doll. Or, or is it? Something about it makes me uneasy. 
Why, I wonder? And why is there a wheelchair in this building? Or a doll, for that matter? There's a doll in the wheelchair. I have a bad feeling about it. More little representations of Alessa, of childbirth, of infancy, which this god is currently growing inside Heather, and very interesting visual display. This one looks a little bit like Pyramid Head without his head. So the smock is very similar. It's got those, like, that white color, the three straps on the side. Um, it's not exact, but it's kind of close. It also bears a bit of resemblance to Valtiel in this uh, game. But this is neither. It's not Valtiel. It's not Pyramid Head. Just similar robe and garb. Things that are related to the cult. Their history, their executioners from the past that wore the same robes, same garb, which is where it comes from. It's why Pyramid Head has it. It's why Valtiel has it. Uh, go ahead, Death by Fugu. Of course, we got slurpers. Slurpers slurping around. Oh, yeah. So, a link for uh, Twin Peaks. Laura Palmer. Screaming at Cooper. Again, similar, but not even as close as the Marilyn Monroe one, which has, like, a definite smile to the corner of the mouth. A little different angle. Teeth look very different. Um, but yeah, interesting. Nonetheless, just for comparison. I don't know what kind of plant this is, but it's withering away. Poor thing. Resident Evil Yellow Herb. Probably not. Hmm, I should buy this game? Good luck, Pico. You're gonna need it. PS2 copies and PC copies for Silent Hill 3 are getting pretty pricey these days. And this game has not been officially released digitally anywhere. And the only more modern versions of it that you can get are the HD collection, which is fucking terrible. Pretty fucking bad. Pretty bad. Fifteen twenty euro PC copy used in Germany. I mean, I guess a lot of it does depend on your region and what version you've managed to find. Um, very good chance it could also be a bootleg because there's a lot of them out there. But that's it. Good luck. But yeah, there's a lot of fakes. There's a lot of fakes out there that people put together. They reprint the boxes, uh, burn the discs, reprint the labels, and they're just like ripped versions um i was a moderator for the speedrun silenthill.com boards and that was one of those relatively common things that we saw where people would start uh people would start wanting to get into speedrunning they're like i picked up a pc copy then they submit runs and we start noticing all sorts of weird shit and we're like what is wrong with your copy of Silent Hill 2 or Silent Hill 3? And uh, once we see enough information, then we're like, oh, this is a bootleg. This is like a, a hacked 
cracked, burned version that somebody made and sold. So, yeah, it happens. It's it's relatively common. Heather, that's what you're called now, isn't it? And who are you? The name's Vincent. Don't forget it, okay? I'm on your side. So you say, but how do I know you're not with her? Her? You mean Claudia? Please don't lump me together with her. She was totally brainwashed by that crazy old hag. Well, I guess crazy old hag is a bit harsh. She is your mother, after all. My mother? What do you mean? You don't remember? Uh, so Harry didn't tell you anything. I guess he hid the truth to keep you on his side, eh? That figures. He's a pretty sneaky guy. Don't talk about my dad like that! Sorry. I apologize. Please, calm down. How do you know my father anyway? I know everything. I know about your past, too. Then tell me what's going on. You don't know even that? That's why I'm asking. If you know everything, then tell me how I could put an end to this. Not yet. Why not enjoy yourself a bit longer? Enjoy? I feel like I'm going crazy. Does this place get to you at all? It gets to me all right. I find it most fascinating. Wait! I'm not finished talking! I knew you were on her side. How do you figure? There's something wrong with you too. So our introduction to Vincent. And again, going back to how this game was when it originally released, as far as like marketing and things go, there it, it was not made obvious when the game first released that this was a sequel, direct sequel to Silent Hill 1. They kept that hidden. They, they hid Heather's last name. They even went so far as to call her Heather Morris, her voice actress's name. Uh, on the back of the North American PS2 first release. Uh, and in everything else, they just call her Heather. They don't talk about who she really is. They don't talk about Harry. They don't talk about anything from Silent Hill 1. So they they did try to keep it relatively vague. Yeah, there was some stuff, Clark, in, in like some, some of the trailers and things at, at certain points. But for the most part... They wanted that to be kind of a, a big twist moment where you get here and then you have Vincent. And if, you've, if you're a fan of Silent Hill 1, you're playing this and you got Vincent talking about, you know, crazy old hag who's your mother. And you're like, okay, that kind of sounds like, you know, Dahlia Gillespie, who is Alessa's mother. Silent Hill 1. And then when he says, you know, Harry didn't tell you anything. And you're like, oh, this is something related to Silent Hill 1. So that's kind of like your, your first really big reveal that this, this has to do with Silent Hill 1. 
So her father, the guy she was talking on the phone uh, to back at the very beginning in the mall, that's Harry Mason, main character from Silent Hill 1. Oxidol, health drinks, first aid. I'm done with these shelves. Oxidol, you use this stuff to disinfect cuts and stuff. It foams when you put it on. Nothing worthwhile on the desk. Uh, so this is another puzzle difficulty thing when you play this on hard mode. Uh, so hard riddles are currently being played. If you play this on easy or normal, you get a textbook here to explain what the Oxidol is for and how it's used. Uh, on hard mode, no extra hints. Do we reckon we'll get an announcement on September 24th for the 20th anniversary of Silent Hill 2? Probably fucking not. <laughs> Konami didn't say anything for the 20th anniversary for Silent Hill 1. Which, you know, anniversary for the whole goddamn series. So, uh... Probably not. Silent Hill 3 turns 18 this year. Silent Hill 3 turned 18 yesterday. May 23rd, when I started this playthrough. I haven't heard anything. Someone check Twitter. Did Konami say anything? Oh no, that's not me breathing. That is, that is this. That is the glutton. A book's lying here. Looks like a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a monster living at the gates of a village. It was a very scary and a very bad monster. It would catch people and crunch them up with its big teeth. The villagers were afraid of the monster and no one would dare approach the gates. Everyone was stuck inside the village. When the king heard about this, he summoned his knights. The knights eagerly rode out to defeat the monster. Ha, take that. Their swords slashed and their spears flashed, but the monster wouldn't die. The monster tossed the knights into its mouth one by one, horses and all. What was the king to do? He fretted and fussed, paced the floor, I could think of no solution. Soon after, the village priestess came to the castle. She was a very kind and good person. The king asked her to defeat the monster guarding the gates. The book's torn. The rest is missing. I remember reading this a long time ago. I think I borrowed it from someone. 
I don't remember how it ended, though. Didn't I read the story through to the end? Wasn't sure if I would go by the American release. I mean, typically a game anniversary goes by whatever it released on first. And... Let's see... Uh, yeah, European release, which came first, was May 23rd. So it was Europe first, May 23rd, uh, July 3rd, uh, in Japan, and then August 5th for North America. Hey, what's up, Newman? So, we have the Glutton. It's technically an enemy, but it never attacks you. It just blocks you from exiting. For some reason, the only thing in the fridge is liver. I hope it's not rotten. This was in the cafe's fridge. Gotta do something with it before it goes bad. Do we? Does it matter? How has it not gone bad already? Is there any explanation on the radio noise coming off the cancer enemy? It's radio noise from the radio. Not, not the enemy. It's literally the radio that I have in my inventory, it goes off when there's any enemy nearby. That is a mechanic of the Silent Hill series of video games. This is not my floor. Japanese studio puts a game in Europe first. Is that some marketing mumbo jumbo that I'm missing? No, the, the first four Silent Hill games were made by a Japanese studio specifically for Western audiences. There's They didn't make like a Japanese dub first and then dub it into English. They hired Japanese act or Japanese team hired English actors. They hired Jeremy Blaustein, the English localization translator, to directly work with them, cast English speaking actors, and make the game in English first. And then it got translated like subtitles. The the text and everything is translated to Japanese for other regions. Uh, and other languages for other regions. But that was always their focus, was to make a horror game specifically for Western audiences. Where can I buy Silent Hill 3 today? On the internet? Maybe eBay? Maybe Amazon? Used? Uh, it's not sold digitally. And try to avoid the HD collection. Well, Amazon does independent sellers and game stores and stuff like that that sell used stuff, so why I suggest it. Ow. Mm -hmm. 
Nope, no online store. Playing dead. All right, matchbook. And I mentioned this earlier, and a lot of people were like, What? What? What are you talking about? So we were talking about it, uh, how I mentioned Heather Smokes. Uh, I was talking about how much information about the character you get from like just examining things in the world and in the environments. And Heather has a lot to say about a lot of things in the environment and much of it will give you insight into her character. So in this game, she's 17 years old and you can check out this burning cigarette butt still smoldering cigarette butt stuck in an ashtray and she says this no more cigarettes for me i quit for good simple quick two little short sentences but for a 17 year old girl who's already started smoking been a smoker at one point and then quit by the time she's 17 says a lot about her character Uh, another movie reference here. Wheelchair on the other side of this uh, glass is a reference to a film called Session 9. And I will show you a comparison screenshot here. go. Session 9. And then this in Silent Hill 3. Session. Session 9. Douglas has a reference in their journal that Heather's 24. Heather thinks she's 17. There's a reference in Harry's journal about the events in Silent Hill 24 years earlier where they got Heather too. That is not correct, Empress. He does have a note about her being 24 because of information that he gets from the cult. The thing is, they're adding on years because of her other lives. They do this as well in the happy birthday call in Brookhaven where they're cumulatively adding how long she was alive as Alessa which was 14 years how long she was alive as Cheryl which was 7 years and how long she's been alive as Heather which is 17 years so at the end of Silent Hill 1 after Alessa's soul has been reunited and she reincarnates into a new baby that newborn baby is Heather but 17 years 17 years from the end of Silent Hill 1 the birth of that new baby to Heather at the current point in this game but before she was reincarnated she lived 14 years as Alessa and when Alessa was seven years old, 
she splits her soul into what becomes Cheryl. And Cheryl also. Heather says she wrote in her journal at the church 17 years earlier, too. Her memories from her past life is what she's referring to, not her as Heather. Because by the time she gets to the church, that's after the memory of Alessa fight, when she has fully regained her memories from her past lives as Alessa and Cheryl. I thought Cheryl and Heather are the same. They are. So... Hard to explain. This is why you should definitely watch my Silent Hill 1 story playthrough if none of this makes sense, because it's explained a lot better throughout the course of that game and then the events of this. So you originally have Alessa. It's just Alessa. Alessa's alive for seven years. After seven years, Dahlia is trying to perform a ritual on Alessa to birth a god. Alessa splits her soul as a way of delaying this from happening. So there is one half of the soul that stays with Alessa at the age of seven, and another half of the soul that becomes a newborn baby on the side of the road, just outside of Silent Hill. That baby gets adopted by Harry Mason. He decides to call that baby Cheryl. He raises that baby for seven years and then takes her to Silent Hill on vacation. That's where the events of Silent Hill 1 start. He goes to vacation with the first baby, named Cheryl. When Cheryl returns to Silent Hill at the beginning of Silent Hill 1, her soul is reunited with Alessa. So Alessa's soul becomes whole again. Seven-year-old Cheryl that we see at the beginning of Silent Hill 1 no longer exists. It's just Alessa again. And that, by that point, Alessa is 14 years old. So then Alessa has the god forced out of her. You kill the god. Alessa's about to die. She reincarnates into a young baby again. She gives this baby to Harry. Harry takes this new baby, this newborn baby at the end of Silent Hill 1, not the seven-year-old Cheryl that he came there with, newborn baby and he also calls her Cheryl but he writes in his journal that we see later that calling her Cheryl in his own words was a mistake because it just reminded him of the first Cheryl so Heather is a totally different incarnation from that original Cheryl from Silent Hill 1 from that from Alessa like, it's the same soul, but her age resets. You wouldn't look at this newborn baby and say, oh, this baby is Alessa's 14 years plus Cheryl's 7 years. It's just a newborn baby. That baby just was born. It's no years old. So... The cult looks at all of those different iterations and reincarnations of Alessa. They add the numbers together, which is why, like, their information's a little confused. And they're the ones who hire Douglas. So that's why Douglas has information that's not accurate. But Heather, as she exists, has only been there for 17 years. It's a weird situation, as said. Hard to explain. Dorian, thank you for the 200 bits. Very much appreciated. Thank you, dude. Speaking of previous incarnations and reincarnation and having memories of past lives, which is a huge, huge part of this game and its themes and its plot. We have this picture. There's a caption under the picture, flame purifies all. So in Silent Hill 1, 
Alessa was very, very badly burned. Um, there's a lot of debate around the reasoning for those burns. Um, some fans believe that she was burned intentionally as part of the ritual uh, being performed by Dahlia Gillespie and the other cult members. Other fans believe that she was burned accidentally, that the stress of the ritual itself, which did not involve burning her, caused her to stress out because she was being impregnated by, a, you know, to give birth to a god. Seven-year-old girl freaks out. She has latent psychic abilities. She blows up the boiler of the Gillespie home and gets seriously burned in the process. Personally, there's decent arguments for both sides. I, I used to kind of take the boiler explosion side a lot more stronger than the ritual involving, you know, burning Alessa in the first place. Um, but honestly, after kind of like looking at all the evidence that's just there in the games without trying to like theory craft with stuff outside of that, both can work. Literally both can work. There's, there, there's not enough evidence to disprove one or the other. The boiler explosion could have happened and that had been the, you know, actual reason for it. Or, you know, it could have been intentional the way Origins depicts it. Origins, by the way, made by absolutely nobody involved with the original games, <laughs> completely different writers, completely unrelated, you know, uh, s sources that they had to go from. So they had to kind of make up their own stuff for a lot of origins. But as I said, there's, there's evidence that can work, uh, for both. If she was burned by the, you know, there's, there's a newspaper article that says boiler explosion. Well, if the house burned down while they're trying to burn Alessa as part of the ritual, they're not just going to write in the paper that it was a cult ritual. And the cult has a lot of control over things in Silent Hill. They could easily fake an article or influence, you know, an article to be written to say the boiler explosion happened. It could be a fake article that the cult just put out. Uh, it it honestly could work either way. So I basically got to the point where I got tired of arguing <laughs> with other Silent Hill fans about which it is. If she was burned intentionally as part of the ritual, if she was burned unintentionally by her own psychic powers, uh, boy, you know, blowing up the boiler um, accidentally. There's evidence for both. on the side of boiler explosion than the ritual because at no point during SH3 do they try to set Heather on fire personally. But you could make the argument that they had to initiate the impregnation on Alessa originally. Um, for Heather, she's reincarnated with the god already inside of her. It just needs to grow. And for the god to grow, it doesn't need that. It just needs negative emotion. It just needs fear. It just needs pain. It just needs sadness, which is why we see that in this game. We see Claudia pushing that negative emotion for her. That's why they go after Harry. That's why Claudia sets those things up. That's why Vincent gets so scared when Heather starts getting mad. We just had that cut scene with Vincent. He starts talking about Harry. Heather gets pissed off. She slams her fist against the door. Don't talk about my dad like that. And Vincent's like, please calm down because he knows that negative emotion is feeding the God inside of her and he doesn't want that to happen. So at that point, she, she doesn't, they don't need an impregnation ritual. The God's already there. It's just a matter of awakening it, giving it the negative emotion to grow. So they don't need to burn her at this point. As said, I've thought about it a lot with the information in just Silent Hill 1 by itself, 
the info in Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 3, some of the extra like uh, materials and stuff that are out there. The Book of Lost Memories talks a little bit about stuff and, you know, all, all these sort of supplemental materials that mention little things here and there. And I've just come to the conclusion that it's left vague. It's left, un, you know, like intentionally vague that, that kind of keeps you guessing. I don't know. I really found stuff that can be used to, to support either side of the argument. And, uh, yeah. Unless you want to go with Origins, in which case... Dahlia Gillespie burned her as part of the ritual and set her own house on fire in the process. Sure. Why not? <laughs> <coughs> so, that long-winded explanation uh, behind us now, we have a painting depicting a bunch of people surrounding a girl in white. Very reminiscent of Alessa at the end of Silent Hill 1, or as the cult refers to her in this game, Saint Alessa. By these remains may a person find the road to paradise. I've seen this picture before. No, wait. I've never seen it. But I do know it, somehow. So she recognizes that this is a depiction of her being burned back when she was Alessa. And, of course, flame purifies all. So we combine things to make a fire. Tipsalon, thank you so much for the Prime sub. Very much appreciate that. Thank you for the support. the uh, crazy Marilyn Monroe mouth and the bleeding ears. Again, uh, Masahiro Ito commented on this, that this represents Alessa's shrieking insanity, as he, as he called it. I love that description. That this memory of Alessa, this part of Alessa that still sort of exists through Heather's soul is losing its sanity. That that part of her is, is going insane. There's that moving sort of bloody texture. Love that stuff. Great visuals. Start a fire in a building you're locked inside of? Seriously, this part had me stumped when I played this first time. Just makes no sense. Do you mean from the perspective of Alessa starting a fire? Or Dahlia doing it for the ritual? Does her insanity explain her nightmare world? No, the nightmare that's happening in this game is happening because there is a cult god that's already inside of Heather, that's been there since she was reincarnated 17 years ago. As that god is growing inside of her, it's affecting reality around her. So it's basically taking what Silent Hill does around the town, what that, what that spiritual power does normally around Silent Hill, and it's able to do it just around Heather, wherever she is. Like, we're not in Silent Hill right now. We're in Portland, Maine. So everything is being altered 
by the influence of that god growing and becoming more and more real inside of Heather. That's what's causing all the nightmare. What might this be? The rest of that fairy tale I read earlier? As a person locked in a building, starting a fire inside of a building you're inside of. In real life, not a good idea. Oh, you mean Heather, like, starting a fire and burning the painting and stuff. Uh, well, yeah. Obviously, like, real-world logic. <laughs> but it's a video game at the end of the day. And, uh, she's got to solve the puzzle to get past the painting. Can't just take it down off the wall and find that there's a door behind it. <laughs> Gotta make it symbolic and burn it. But yeah, it's a, you know, it's a puzzle for a video game. Logic does not always apply. The priestess accepted the king's request and went to the village gates. When she saw the monster, she tried to convince it with words instead of killing it. Shut up, you. I'm going to eat you up. The monster didn't listen to a word the priestess said. But she kept trying to convince the monster to give up. It's wrong to eat people, you know. The monster grew very angry at this and attacked her, killing her with a single mighty blow. The end. I mean, at least she has the fire contained. It's like in a little bucket. It's not just like right there on the floor. Do I ever do kill all runs? Every once in a while. Yep. Because you've got to kill a lot of enemies, basically all the enemies multiple times over to unlock the Heather Beam secret weapon, New Game Plus weapon. Uh, you also need to kill a shit ton of enemies to do the possessed ending. I'm not doing either of those things for this playthrough. This is more just the regular new game, explain the story in depth playthrough. Um, but at some point, I'm going to come back to this and do the new game plus stuff. We'll do the possessed ending. We'll unlock all the other difficulties. We'll unlock Heather Beam. And in those playthroughs, uh, we'll be killing most of, if not everything, in a run. But otherwise, if you're not going for those specific things, there's not really a whole lot of reason to do it. Or 10-star, if you go in for 10-star rank. That's another reason to, to kill a bunch of stuff. But again, not the goal of this stream. This is just to go through, talk about the story. And stopping and killing everything is like 200 and something enemies that don't really need to be killed. The lamp's shining on some old silver coins I know I've seen before. I got one earlier, so I shouldn't really take any more. I mean, I'm no thief. I might act like one now and then, though. So I mentioned uh, earlier in the playthrough, like when we were in the mall, how Heather kind of comments about like, oh, you know, there's. I wish that ring that I liked was still here. Bummer that it's not. And how they kind of explain... Uh, the survival horror protagonist tendency to, to just pick things up and keep them. So they give it to her in like little bits of text like that. You know, she acts like a thief a little bit every once in a while. Every, every now and then she'll take things. She's a bit of a klepto. Something written on the wall. Thus one's life turns to riches. What was a bag of silver coins is now the number in a book. Yet fate hath no price. Ah, but do people know this? Silver coin? It's about the size of a quarter. I get the feeling it's really old. He 
seems like fate does have a price, and it's exactly one of whatever those coins are. So that we can get a nice key in a can. It's really funny that Heather's mentality earlier was you look at some stuff and she says, uh, oh, I don't want to eat or drink anything uh, from an alternate universe. Uh, and um, now she's like, yeah, put the coin in the machine. Give me a soda. Referencing Judas and the silver coins he got from betraying Jesus. I don't know. They do make a lot of, like, slight biblical references throughout the series. Uh, a little bit more in 2 than in 3, but it's not without them. Also, look at the typo. What was a bag of silver keons? Scions. This question's been riding on me. Why did they make Silent Hill Shattered Memories? Psh, you're asking the wrong guy. They should have made Silent Hill Cold Heart. Um, I don't know. Ask Tom Hewlett on Twitter. See what he says. Do it, it'll be funny. So, got a key. I'm sure those don't work. Yeah. We're good to go back to first floor. We can get through there now. love this room like it seems like a really kind of simple room it's like oh yeah there's just blood on everything not the first time we've seen that but again it's this aesthetic we kind of talked about at the very very beginning where there's this theme of like voids just like endless voids and pits with structure just like coming out of them we have all these tables and everything set up around this giant bottomless pit and the legs of these tables just go down and down and down I don't know I like that just a cool visual detail the end of that fairy tale The king and his people shed tears at the death of the kind priestess. God took pity upon them, and granting their wishes, healed the priestess. The priestess opened up her eyes just as she had done every morning of her life. She went once more to the monster's lair. So, previously in the story, priestess was killed. Now she's opening her eyes just as she had done every morning. Again, the sort of ideas of... Resurrection, rebirth, reincarnation, um, all reflective in Heather's actual life or lives at this point. Fool, you wish to die again. No, this time it's your turn. The priestess had come to defeat the monster once and for all. As the priestess was very, very kind... She felt sad about this task, but it had to be done. Swords and spears won't work. 
Arrows and bullets will just bounce off. You can't kill me. The monster laughed. But the priestess used neither sword nor spear. She chanted but a single spell. Tu fui, ego eris. Do you know what happened then? The monster let out a huge cry and then died and vanished. Thus the villagers were able to use their gates once more. Everyone lavished their gratitude upon the priestess, and they all lived happily ever after. Now if only we could get a priestess, somebody with some magical abilities, or at the very least some latent psychic powers, to say those magic words and get rid of that giant monster blocking the exit. Tu fui, ego eres. Weird writing. <gasps> what was that? And... Just like that. Turns out Heather is the priestess. The giant monster blocking the gates, just like in the fairy tale, is gone. Some good dialogue if you try to go this way and examine the, uh, the blockade here. My apartment is the other way. But what is this thing blocking the path? Am I still having that nightmare? So close to my home? My home. My dad. Is he okay? I'm sure he is. He must be. My apartment's the other way. Like she just remembered. Oh shit! My dad. This stuff is happening so close to my apartment. That weird guy knew who my dad was. There's Eddie's van again. Villa Apartments. And the very annoying hallway with a lot of mistakes. There's there's like a lot of noticeable little mistakes in text and detail and stuff in this hallway, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, so if we look at Heather's house key, it says Daisy Villa Apartment number 102. It's carved into the key. So that's the key to her front door, her apartment. It's 102. The very first door that you come to in the hallway, 102. That's not my place. Couldn't be this 102. Every other door has a unique number. 105, 104, But there are two 102s. There's the first one, and then there's where her actual apartment is. And I wonder if they meant it to be that first apartment so that you go in as soon as you enter. And then they realized, like, well, then nobody's going to go and explore the rest of this little apartment hallway. So they moved it further down so that people would have to go a little further in and they could put a few more things in the hallway. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But different 102. I don't know why there's two 102s. There's also a bunch of broken text. Not like, it's like not translated correctly and typoed. I don't know whose stuff this is, but I think I'll leave it alone. None of it is really can help me out right now. I'll read that again. Don't worry, you're not having a stroke. That's the text on the screen. 
none of it is really can help me out right now. <laughs> okay. That text was a mood. No kidding. And then we also have another save point. Pretty important text when you examine the save points and Heather's like remembering things. What's this doing here? That really pisses me off. It's like having someone spit on your sacred place. Looking at that makes me head hurt. What does it mean? Looking at that makes me head hurt. Oh, me head hurts. What happened in this hallway? Why is everything wrong? <laughs> Uh, one more Silent Hill 2 Easter egg in this hallway. This is another one of those things that's only there if you have... If you're playing the PS2 version, you had to have a save file from Silent Hill 2 on the same memory card that you're playing Silent Hill 3 with. And for the PC version, you just have to use a mod to make these Easter eggs available. The mailbox is empty. Wait, what? Easter egg? Easter egg. Why is there no Easter egg? I don't know whose stuff this is, but I think I'll leave it alone. None of it is really can help me out right now. Uh, is the mod not working? Oh, that sucks. Maybe, is that one New Game Plus only? That might be New Game Plus only. It should work. The earlier Silent Hill 2 one worked. Um, well, shit. So there's just a little bit of text. It, it's not like a full-on cutscene like the toilet one. It's just some text that references Silent Hill 2. Um, instead of it just saying the mailbox is empty, there's a little bit of extra text that comes up and says there's not even a dead... Uh, there's not even a letter from a dead wife or anything, and I don't have one of those anyway. So it makes a little reference to Letter from a Dead Wife not being in the mailbox. Just more more Silent Hill 2 tongue-in-cheek reference stuff. Um, it might just be New Game Plus, or maybe the mod is not working correctly. But it's appropriate that everything in this hallway is broken, even the Easter egg that should be there. So, yay, me head hurts. Oh boy. Well, let's save and uh, get ready for fucking sad, fucking sad, sad times. We could just stay here. We could just stay here and never go in. And, and pretend it's all okay. But we have to go in. We have to say goodbye. Oh. Dad, I'm home. Listen, something really crazy is going on. I think we should... Dad? Dad?
Did you do this? You're late. But why? Why? We've been to the 17 years ago for one thing. If not for him, our dream would have come true. And then he took you away from us. Get you, you bitch. They changed that line into I'll get you, you bitch for the HD collection instead of I'll get you for this. I don't know why. I don't know why they changed lines. I, I can kind of understand why they would try to re record voices, whatever. That's one thing. I have no idea why they changed the script. Thought HD said, I'll fucking kill you, you bitch. No, it's, it's, it's just that last part. That would be funnier, though. If they just added a whole bunch more to it. I'll fucking kill you, you bitch. You cocksucker, motherfucker. Heather's just like... <laughs> spouting it off. Too early. Fuck. Got him. Right in the nuts. Just... Calm down? How am I supposed to do that? My father is dead! He's murdered! Get out! This is all your fault! If it weren't for you... I'm sorry. Then go! If it make you feel better, I will. So Heather tells Douglas to go, Douglas agrees to leave, and then Heather realizes that moving a body by yourself is really hard. So Douglas is still here. Is he okay like this? What else can I do? There's no one here to give him a decent burial. Sorry, Dad. What do you do now? 
I'm going to Silent Hill. What's in Silent Hill? I don't know. Do you think it's safe? Of course it isn't. I don't know what kind of hell is waiting for me there, but I've got no other choice. care about God or paradise, if that's what she believes, then fine. But she won't get away with what she did. When I find her, I'll kill her myself. Revenge doesn't solve Maybe not, but that's what I'm going to do. How you gonna get there? None of your business. I'll give you a ride. I don't need your help. Yeah, but it's too far to walk. Besides, I'm partly responsible for this. I'll bring the car around back. Come by when you finish saying goodbye. You know, you might die too. That's fine. Nobody's gonna cry over my grave. Waski asks, is this the end? It has been 10 and a half hours. This is the halfway point. This is the halfway point in the game. We're just now about to finally go to Silent Hill. In a game called Silent Hill 3. We're finally about to go there. This is just the first half and the big reveal that her father is Harry Mason and that this is a continuation of the story of Silent Hill 1. And now he's dead. And Heather wants revenge. And now it's time to go to Silent Hill. I'll find that woman and make her pay. I promise I will. I wonder if my dad would be mad at me for thinking that way. I'll be back, Dad. I promise I'll come home soon. Um, the model, by the way, that's used for Harry Mason in this game, uh, for his, his body sitting in the chair, is a James Sunderland model. It's James from Silent Hill 2 but they put textures on him to make it look like Harry's clothes and hair. But the core model itself is, is James. Dad, why did you have to die? You told me you were the strongest man in the world. Liar. Liar. Yeah, it's a little bit different face. Mostly, like, the way the textures are applied to it kind of changed the way the face looks. Uh, there's some photos and stuff. Not a whole lot. But there's some photos on the wall here that are kind of hard to see. That are somewhat more realistic looking. Um, there used to be another photo on this wall that is not so realistic looking, so it's understandable why they removed it for the final version of the game. Like for the retail release. Because originally on this wall, there was this. And man, that's just so like, Uncanny Valley looking with Silent Hill 1 model like CG model FMV model yeah me and my PS1 dad 
<laughs> I mean, it's a cute sen sentiment, but it definitely didn't look quite right. So weird that she calls him a liar. I don't get it. I mean, it. she's upset. Her father just died and used to tell her that he's the strongest man in the world. And now, now he's gone and she's trying to cope with that. She's calling him a liar. He wasn't the strongest man in the world. Because that's Artie from Pete and Pete. We're gonna see how old a lot of people in chat are if they get that reference. Just the regular TV. There's nothing different about it. Shoutouts to UFO Techie. Look at that otter. Look at the otter. Yeah, Dorian, of course. Is totally fine with me. I don't remember exactly when, but I think I got this doll at a garage sale. I still like it, but there's nothing I can do with it right now. What? is wrong with your face. You swallow a mouthful of bumblebees? change I'll leave it alone this is my dresser she's fine she doesn't want to change she's fine wearing her vest covered in her father's blood oh lord what is this queen <laughs> So, in her dresser, Heather had a stun gun. And, uh, it's not, not a good weapon, but, well, it's okay for certain things. Mostly, I like picking it up just to read the descriptions. Stun gun, high voltage to zap the bad guys. It has to touch them, though, so it's very short range. My worrywart dad gave this to me, just in case. I don't usually carry it with me, because it's bulky and gets in the way. Instead, she prefers her fucking switchblade. See, she just loves walking around with this. Why stun him when you could stab him? go to Silent Hill. And if you're one of the people who played this game without playing Silent Hill 1, I just met some guy named Vincent. They're gonna explain the plot. Vincent? He's a friend of yours, right? I'm not sure. He said when we get to Silent Hill to look for a guy named Leonard. And he gave me this map. What do you want to do? We can't trust him, but... We've got no other choice. Here, take this too. 
What's this? Your father was holding it. What's the deal with Silent Hill anyway? It used to be a nice, quiet little town. But now... You've been there? Once, on a missing persons case. Never did find him. But I'll tell you, that's one screwed up town. My line of work you hear a lot of nasty rumors. I was born and raised there. <sighs> Sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. No offense taken. Anyway, I thought you grew up in Portland. Wrong. Feeling sick? My head's pounding like the worst hangover ever. Maybe your car's sick. No. I'm just trying to remember my childhood. Something terrible happened in Silent Hill 17 years ago. A woman named Dahlia. She tried to summon the ancient god of the town. She offered up her very own daughter. That's crazy. Maybe so, but it worked. The girl gave birth to a god. Huh? You see... That girl had special powers. Powers? Her classmates called her a witch. She could make things happen with her mind. She could kill people just by wishing for it. But in the end, that god was killed by a single person. My father, Harry Mason. I guess it wasn't much of a god if it could be killed by a human being. But I think Claudia's trying to do the same thing again. And I've been chosen as the sacrifice. You've got some kind of power in you too? the god was killed, the girl reappeared. She was holding a baby in her arms. Before she died, she gave the baby to my father. was his very own daughter. Even though he didn't know who or what I was. It was so sudden. I never had a chance to tell you, to tell you how happy you made me.
Somebody head for that Leonard guy's house. You check out the hospital. You got the map, right? Yeah. You gonna be okay alone? I'm not a child, you know. Are you sure it's not you who's afraid to be alone? You're right. I am afraid. I'm 50 something years old. I ain't never seen nothing like this. I still feel like I'm dreaming. <laughs> More like a nightmare, I'd say. <sighs> yeah. I want to wake up and have a smoke already. Meet me back here when you finish looking around the hospital. Okay? Roger. Is that Kaufman? No. Kaufman's dead. That is Douglas. As cool as Brookhaven is, uh, part of me wishes we can go back to Alcamilla. See, this is the part where I, I totally agree. The this, this second half of this game, where you're actually in Silent Hill, it's pretty good. But I really wish it would have been retracing Harry's footsteps. I wish you would have been seeing that old, you know, side of Silent Hill. The other side of town but in ps2 graphics and like re-exploring the same areas finding harry's notes and notepads and stuff um and just sort of retracing silent hill one at this point uh god that would have been so good and i that was probably what they originally had planned was for heather to go to that part of silent hill and retrace harry's footsteps and and kind of go through all of that because little elements of that have worked in but then they would have had to completely remake all of the Silent Hill 1 map stuff or at least large chunks of it uh, in PlayStation 2 graphics remodel everything redo everything in the PS2 engine or they were looking at all of this data that they had from making Silent Hill 2 and they're like, we already made this big, expansive other side of the town in PS2 graphics for Silent Hill 2. We could just copy it over and use that. And budget and time, it would make sense to do that. But man, I would have loved to have seen Silent Hill 1, like, side of the town in PS2 graphics and have Heather running around and exploring, retracing Harry's footsteps. God, that would have been so good. It's got to be a coincidence. But still, that's pretty weird. Who could have done this? So, that whole drive over, that's a great cutscene, beautiful song, and a good sort of plot dump for people who didn't play or don't remember Silent Hill 1. A lot of the things we were talking about earlier, people were confused about the timeline, people were confused about Heather's age, things like that. She straight up says, you know, 17 years. Um, pretty much just explains the plot of Silent Hill 1. Uh, that Harry killed a god that uh, that girl with psychic powers reincarnated and that that was her so we get a nice nice exposition there for the car ride scene and now we're in Silent Hill Silent Hill 2 Silent Hill but still Silent Hill And 
Damn, it's foggy out. It only took us 11 hours, but we're here. Jack's in. Come on, let me go to Rosewater Park. They also don't even give you, like, a big chunk of the town to go and look at. So much of it is blocked. I love this track, this ambient music. So good, they used it for the movie. I don't need to go there. That's the wrong place to be. Well, fine. I just, I just want to go and look at the town. I just want to go to Andy's Pizza. The game looks like our weather outside right now. Yeah, I was honestly just gonna say, uh, the the rain and and sound effects of the cutscene that were uh, during the driving segment, that driving cutscene with Douglas on the way to Silent Hill, was blending in very nicely with my real world ambient sounds right now. Because there's rain hitting my bedroom window. Uh, it is it is gross and rainy and foggy out, so it's a good day for playing some Silent Hill for way too long. Let's hope that uh, the rain doesn't steal my power or internet connection. Rosewater Park. There's Eddie's van. It's Eddie's van again. The Texan station. Where you get the steel pipe in Silent Hill 2 right here. The newspaper machine where you get uh, the Book of Lost Memories in Silent Hill 2. Mysteriously missing. It's normally right here next to these machines. Annoying pendulums making loud noises and generally pissing me off. Pete's Polarama. Shut tight, won't open at all. Fuck. Wanna go bowling? So yeah, you're you're pretty limited here with how much you get to go and look at. Try to run this way. I don't need to be here now. All right, fine. We're going to Blookhaven. Are Silent Hill 3 manifestations the same as Silent Hill 1 in essence? Uh, very much so. Not exactly the same, but in Silent Hill 1, they are strictly from Alessa, from her mind, as it was at that time. But 17 years later, it's things from Alessa's mind, things from the original Cheryl's mind, things from this Cheryl, a.k.a. Heather's mind. Some of those sort of warp together. Uh, sometimes taken from each of them individually. But it's working more or less the same as it did in Silent Hill 1. The town's power is changing reality based on Alessa or Cheryl or Heather or whatever you want to call her. Look, there's our uh, shining reference posters. I showed these for the Silent Hill 2 
playthrough. A lot of this stuff I, I already showed during the uh, the Silent Hill 2 in-depth, but we'll, we'll show the comparison just for anybody who didn't see it. Shining poster, Jack Nicholson. And the poster on the wall for comparison. Yeah, the texture's actually not as clear as it is in Silent Hill 2. They let us go inside Heaven's Night. They do. Is the Kami artwork here? It's gone. They took down the Kami from Street Fighter concept art that they kept up above the door in Silent Hill 2. <laughs> Spooky. It's a tourism pamphlet. I had forgotten it, but it's true. Silent Hill was originally a resort town. Welcome to Silent Hill. Silent Hill, a quiet little lakeside resort town. We're happy to have you. Take some time out of your busy schedules and enjoy a nice, restful vacation here. Row after row of quaint old houses, a gorgeous mountain landscape, and a lake which shows different sides of its beauty, with the passing of the day from sunrise to late afternoons to sunset. Silent Hill will move you and fill you with a feeling of deep peace. I hope your time here will be pleasant and your memories will last forever. Editor Roger Widmark. Same exact Roger Widmark article uh, about Silent Hill that you find in the apartments in Silent Hill 2. Word for word, exact same one. It's a tourism pamphlet. I had forgotten it, but it's true. Silent Hill was originally a resort town. So I like that comment that she had forgotten it because, like, by this point in the game's timeline, like, it hasn't been a, a functioning tourist town for a long time. So long that she had forgotten it. Because you kind of get the, the impression, like, with Silent Hill 1, that shortly before Harry showed up, there was still... Some people there, but not very many. Lisa mentions that a lot of people moved away when shit started getting weird, but that it was like, you know, a tourist town relatively not too long before that. Silent Hill's supposed to be built on sacred Indian land, and that's part of why it's sort of cursed. That is the main assumption. That's kind of like the trope is. They specifically say there were native tribes that lived here and the spiritual power was what they saw as their ancestors, the spirits that inhabited the trees, uh, the rocks, the water, and then English settlers came, pushed all the natives away, the power became corrupted either through the tribes being forced out or the new religions and cult forming in its place. Um, but it's never made explicitly clear, like if there's an origin of the town's power or why it is the way that it is. Like we only get little tiny bits and pieces of, of like the history. And as far as we know, it's just a fucked up place. It's just, it's just a place where there's a spiritual power that affects whoever's there. So if it's the native tribes, it shapes itself based on their beliefs. If it's crazy Puritans, 
It shapes itself based on their beliefs. Crazy cultists, so on. You know, it just sort of feeds, not even necessarily feeds off of, just is influenced by whoever seems to be in the area. But it may have just been there indefinitely. We don't know. The Silent Hill appears a mostly empty resort town that's not foggy and filled with monsters to most people. Always wondered. Uh, it depends. It depends. There's lots of different ways that they sort of show that in the series. Um, if you're going by like Silent Hill 1 logic, then if there's no nightmare going on, no Alessa that's sort of the source to cause the other world to be a thing, there are still lots of weird things that happen, but everyone is seeing the same thing. They're seeing the same town. It has residents. It has tourists. You know, whatever. Um, if you go by the Silent Hill 2 logic, everybody sees different things. So James sees it as rusty and run down. Eddie sees it as cold and full of people who are mocking him. Angela sees it on fire. Laura just sees an empty normal town. Like, no no people in it, but it's not, like, dangerous. There's no monsters to her, you know, nothing like that. So Silent Hill 2 has, like, a totally different take on it. And there's, it's not really consistent. There's no definite answer of, like, what is reality? How, like, if it's perceived the same by everybody... If it's perceived by people differently, um, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of concrete answer there. We get, as said, little bits of information here and there. It was a tourist town. We know that from various different games and people talking about it. It's definitely been dwindling in population since before the events of Silent Hill 1. Lisa talks about that. Um... So yeah, it's it's hard to know what it's like for everybody if you're just a random schmuck that wanders into the town who doesn't really have deep-seated trauma. Uh you, you probably won't really see anything. You'll probably just see like an abandoned town if you're in kind of this time period where Heather is. But yeah, they're very very vague about that. It's it's intentionally left sort of open to interpretation. Another Silent Hill 2 reference here. It's a flyer from a club. It shows a woman with long black hair. The return of Lady Maria from 8 p.m. on the 27th. Lady Maria, but specifically long black hair. A very different Maria. Because the Maria that existed in Silent Hill 2 was just a manifestation. Specifically for James. No one saw her but James. Maria was an Alessa's creation, right? Not Alessa's. The town created her based on James's mind. What he wanted out of Mary. He wanted, you know, Mary was very reserved and sick. He wanted someone more outgoing and sexy who still resembled his wife, Mary. But that was the town creating a manifestation based on James's desire. Brookhaven. (laughs) 
our map. Got a save point with no text, sadly. No memories coming back text. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm going to beach in the sea. I'm about ready. I'm ready, ready to start beaching in the sea. Darn. Do we know definitively how long has passed between Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 1? No. Not at all. A lot of fans stress themselves out trying to piece together a timeline. Um, and ultimately, it was just something that the devs didn't really want to be specific about. And so a lot of things are vague and intentionally confusing when it comes to trying to piece it all together into like an overall timeline. A lot of people have theorized that Silent Hill 2 takes place before Silent Hill 1 because the way that characters dress and James's model of car and things like that make it look like it takes place in the 70s but there are still elements and technology around the town from 80s, like uh, the VHS player. Um, so, as said, fans have argued about that sort of stuff, tried to piece together timelines. Even the later games, there's like supplemental materials for Homecoming that are fucking hilarious. Because Homecoming tries to explain the timeline and they're so unsure about the timeline themselves that they just sort of like smudge out numbers and cross stuff out so it's like in 19 something these events happened and then in 19... And it's just like scribbles. Where they're like, uh, we don't know. <laughs> and it's like, if you don't know, don't bother fucking trying. Like, don't force it. Just leave the timeline alone. It doesn't matter. It only really matters for Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 3, and they say it very blunt and very clearly, you know, 17 years ago. Heather was just in the car with Douglas, she talked about the events of Silent Hill 1, and she says 17 years ago that stuff happened. There we go. It's been 17 years since Silent Hill 1 happened. Outside of that, we don't know what year Silent Hill 1 took place in. We don't know what the current year for Silent Hill 3 is. What happened in between. Like, yeah. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. There are a lot of things stuck to the wall. A cookie, a toothbrush, a spoon, a Christmas card, a clock... Whoever it was probably used glue, but why do this in the first place? Hey, what's up, J-Rock? Possible that James was so disillusioned that he thought his outfit and car were still in style? Maybe that's just his style. Maybe he just likes... likes that stuff. There's a key glued to the wall. Love to take it with me, but it's really stuck tight. 
can't even pull it off. locked but the elevator works so Brookhaven's one of those things that uh, it throws me off it throws me off when I play this game especially since I played Silent Hill 2 recently because this is the exact same Brookhaven it's the exact same layout of Brookhaven from Silent Hill 2 but different doors and stuff are locked and the way you progress through Brookhaven between Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3 is, is completely reversed. In Silent Hill 2, the elevator doesn't work. So you, well, you're tr it's locked. So you're trying to get the elevator key. And you're going from floor to floor solving puzzles to get the elevator key so that you can use the elevator. Um... And you're going from floor to floor using the stairwell in Silent Hill 2 in order to unlock the elevator. In Silent Hill 3, it's the opposite. The stairwell is locked, and you're going from floor to floor solving puzzles using the elevator to get the key to open the stairwell. But a lot of the same rooms that you go into in Silent Hill 2 in order to get necessary progression items and puzzle things are the same rooms that you go into in three, but some of them are different. It's it just, even after all these years, this hospital fucks with my head when I've been playing two and then play three, like right after or vice versa. There's stuff written on the whiteboard, but none of it really matters to me. That's the stuff about the patient wing keypad code in Silent Hill 2. There's a memo posted on the refrigerator. Food only. Do not store drugs. I wonder if it's okay to store health drinks in here. Apparently, because there is one. It's a medical record, or something. It's for this Leonard guy. Could this be the same Leonard that Vincent was talking about? Room S12, presenting mild audiovisual hallucinations, emotional instability, obsessive ideas, suspect mild schizophrenia, will continue observation. Basically calm and cooperative, with a strong sense of justice. However, according to reports, becomes very violent when overexcited. That is an understatement. The other one is for Stanley Coleman. Room S07. Usually passive and cowardly. Also egotistical. Sometimes shows and acts on an obsessive attachment to a particular woman. This has caused violent incidents. Use caution. Also understatement. Yo, what's up, Techie? Good morning, dude. Um, so this is one of those parts where I, I don't do this a whole lot where I write down like really extensive character explanation notes for myself, but I had so many questions and so many things to try to piece together when it comes to Leonard that in the past I went through and made a whole bunch of notes about little things here and there, and eventually kind of pieced it all together into one kind of long uh, note to explain stuff. So... Should I read this now or wait until the end? 
I'll wait. I'll wait until we get kind of done with Brookhaven and Leonard, and then I'll read my notes on the character and see what you guys think. For now, we'll just play through. And all I can say is try to remember all the little things that I bring up about Leonard as we go. And then I'll try to piece it all together at the end by reading my notes. One of these is Stanley's room. There we go. Well, not his room, but... Our first note, our first uh, diary. So, I like this. If you examine the doll first, Heather says this. There must have been kids here too then. I played with dolls like this when I was a child too. It really takes me back. So she's like reminiscing. She's assuming, oh, there must be must have been kids in this hospital. There's dolls, you know. She used to have dolls. Takes her back to childhood. And then we read this. This day has finally come. That's right, the day when you and I will meet. I was always thinking of you here in this gloomy cell. I never even knew your name or face until today but now I know I know you're the one I've been waiting for and haven't you been waiting for me too that's why you came to rescue me oh how I love you Heather I want to give you my prized doll I made to commemorate our meeting the start of this everlasting love I can already see your smiling face Stanley Coleman we get this creepy fucking note from Stanley, Stanley Coleman, the patient we just read about in the other room. So it turns out that is not a doll that belongs to a child like Heather initially thought. It's Stanley's prized doll that he's trying to give to Heather as a gift. So at first she's like, oh, there must be kids here. You know, I had dolls take me down memory lane. You read that, and then you check the doll again. Disgusting. I won't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Complete 180. <sighs> All right, that's about all we can do on this floor. Now, floor two. Hey, map. Thank you. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. Broken lock. And another Stanley book. You may not yet have realized your own true feelings, but you sense them, unconsciously. And so you're trying to get closer to me. That's a virtue, the path to paradise. If the door is locked, open it. Use the password for the prison gates. Doctor... I've forgotten his name. Anyway, that quack, as it posted. He should be here, too. I mean, four numbers would have been good enough, but he kept on going. Isn't it a shame? I'm not there. Aren't you irritated? I long for you. You're so cruel. Still, I want you, Heather. Ugh. Stanley Coleman. Thank you. 
Same room that we go into in Silent Hill 2. This is where you would get the shotgun and the uh, bent needle that's stuck in a teddy bear. And you once again return here, same room, Silent Hill 3. You get the nail polish remover and some perfume. Perfume is a really weird item. Perfume. This stuff smells a little strange. It's equippable. So equipping the perfume actually makes it so that monsters will uh, be more aggressive towards you from further away. The same way that like turning off your flashlight makes it so that they don't notice you until they're much closer. The perfume's like the opposite. Oh my lord. Cat Link. Cat, thank you so much for the raid. It has been far too long. Hope you were having a good stream. Hope you're having a good morning so far. Welcome, everybody. Playing some Resident Evil Village. Very nice. I'll eventually get to it, like, three years later, like I usually do with new games. Maybe not quite that long. But I'm definitely not in a hurry to jump on, on the bandwagon and start playing it yet. Was swell doing the speed runs and stuff. Hell yeah. I watched a little bit of Maxi doing that. It's crazy there's already like out of bounds stuff found like day one practically. But welcome everybody. If anyone's new here, I'm Nub Zombie. I do, uh, I've been streaming Silent Hill stuff since like 2015. I, uh, I took a pretty long break this last like year and a half or so uh, away from Silent Hill and streaming in general haven't been doing a whole lot and just recently started doing uh, full-time streaming again so I do super in-depth uh, very long playthroughs of Silent Hill games all the games in the series even the little minor spin-off ones and um, yeah we talk about the development of the games uh, bits of trivia about them show off some easter eggs read a bunch of notes, watch as many cutscenes as possible, uh, discuss the lore in great depth, talk about fan theories, uh, all sorts of stuff. Super in-depth Silent Hill stuff. And uh, yeah, I've been going through the whole series between last week and this week. Uh, last week we did Silent Hill 1 and 2. Today uh, we're getting through Silent Hill 3. We're at uh, 11 and a half hours. And we're like... A little over halfway through the game, we still have a lot to go through. We are well over my estimate for how long this would take. I was telling myself I'm going to try to get through it a little bit faster and a little bit more reasonably um, because I'm trying to do streams every night this week to get through Silent Hill 3, 4, Origins, Homecoming, Shattered Memories, and Downpour by Friday. I thought I could do this in like nine hours. I've done this in like eight or nine hours in the past. We're at 11 and a half hours. And I've still got about half a game to go. <laughs> so, thank you for the raid, Kat. Uh, very much appreciate it. And thank you for that big 33 months of support. Very much appreciate it. And happy belated birthday, also. I think I'm not misremembering right that was a thing that was a thing very recently happy birthday miss your face hopefully we can start having like in-person gdqs again before too long but um yeah, welcome. Get comfy. We're going to do some Silent Hill 3. We're going to read some really creepy notes and solve some really dumb puzzles.
There's a typewritten memo posted here. What's this supposed to mean? Oh, you guys are just in time for me to read, like, the creepiest fucking note in this whole game. Oh my god, Drewzilla. Thank you for the five gift subs. Very much appreciate it. Showing some love for the community. Showing some support. Thank you so much. That is very, very kind of you. Deus Ex Logic, Leo for the win, Magnum95, Gut Slush, and Sednik you. Enjoy the subs. Enjoy the emotes, courtesy of Drew. Drewzilla, thank you so much. All right, creepiest note in Silent Hill 3. Your eyes, blue like a glassy bead. You are always looking at me, and I am always looking at you. Ah, you're too meek, beautiful, unspoiled. Thus I'm so sad, I suffer, and so happy, it hurts. I want to hurt you and destroy myself. What you would think if you knew how I felt. Would you simply smile, not saying a word? Even curses from your mouth would be as beautiful as pearls. I place my left hand on your face as though we were to kiss. Then I suddenly shove my thumb deep into your eye socket, abruptly, decisively like drilling a hole. And what would it feel like? Like jelly? Trembling with ecstasy, I obscenely mix it around and around. I must taste the warmth of your blood. How would you scream? Would you shriek? It hurts, it hurts. As cinnabar red tears stream from your crushed eye. You can't know the maddening hunger I felt in the midst of our kisses. So many of them I've lost count. As though drinking in your cries, I bring my hopes to fruition. Biting your tongue, shredding it. Biting at your lips, as if tasting your lipstick. Oh, what euphoric heights I would reach, having my desires fulfilled like a greedy, gluttonous cur. I longed, too, for your cherry-tinted cheeks, tasty enough to bewitch my tongue. I would surely be healed, and would cry like a child. And how is your tender ear? It brushes against my cheek. I want it to creep up to my lips so I can sink my teeth into its flesh. Your left ear, always hearing words whispered sweet as pie. I want it to hear my true feelings. I never lied, no, but I did have my secrets. Ah, but what must you think of me? Do you hate me? Are you afraid? as though inviting you to the agony at the play's end. If you wish, you could destroy me. I wouldn't care. As you wish, you may destroy me. I wouldn't care. Not signed, but based on all the creepy shit we've been reading, I would guess that's written by Stanley. And of course, you have to read it carefully. <laughs> like Big Nono said, the hardest thing about solving this puzzle is having to carefully read it. That puzzle is how we figure out the, the code for this keypad. Makes perfect sense, right? Absolute perfect sense. So, give me a second, let me pull up notes, because even knowing how this is supposed to be solved 
does not make sense to me. So I want to pull this up and go over my notes of how you're supposed to solve it. And why I feel like even knowing that doesn't quite work. So, the main thing is the poem goes through and very specifically mentions different parts of a face. Pure eyes, blue like a glassy bead, you are always looking at me, and I am always looking at you. So, that is in reference to the keypad. It's always facing you. You're always facing it. It never changes when you're actually entering numbers in. So you go through and specifically pay attention whenever it mentions parts of the face, especially when talking about doing violent things and following blood. So place my left hand on your face as though we were to kiss. So if you look at the keypad as though it were a face and you put your left hand on someone's face, it would be on the right side of their face. Then I suddenly shove my thumb deep into your eye socket, abruptly, decisively, like drilling a hole. So, essentially, you're starting with the eye socket. What's supposed to be the eye. But, here's the thing. I, I know what the solution to the puzzle is already. It's always the same answer. It's just about how you're supposed to interpret the poem and come to the conclusion of that answer. So, jams the thumb into the eye using their left thumb, which would be your left side. If this was a face, you're supposed to view this as the right eye, the bridge of the nose, the left eye, the right ear, the nose, the left ear, and then the right cheek, the mouth, and the left cheek. As the poem mentions cheeks, mentions eyes, mentions biting at your tongue and your lips, or the mouth. So you're supposed to follow the sequence of events in the poem but it starts off with left eye. Specifically, left, well, their right eye, your left hand. So the way it's worded is cinnabar red tears stream from your crushed eye, and that they're drinking in your cries. Now, on an actual face, if the blood was running down from your eye, it would go to your cheek. So if you were to assume it was the eye where they dug their thumb in, you would guess one for the first digit, which is wrong. If you thought about it as a normal face and you have all these numbers assigned to parts of the face, remember 7 and 9 are the 
right and left cheeks. If blood ran down from the eye on a normal face, it would be on your cheek. So if it came down from the right eye, it would end up on the right cheek, which would be seven, which is also wrong. Literally, the first digit is four, which, as said before, is supposed to be the right ear. But you're supposed to interpret it as this being the eye, it gets crushed, the blood streams down, so you go down from one to four. It already doesn't really follow the logic that it wants you to follow. If you're looking at it as a face, the blood wouldn't run down from your eye to your ear, it would go down to your cheek. So do they want us to look at it as a face, or do they want us to look at it as literal which number is below which on a keypad? But that's the way you're supposed to interpret it. That's like the intended way you're supposed to try and solve it. So eye is crushed, runs down to the ear, I guess. What if the person crushing the eyes on top of the other person who's laying flat on the ground? The blood would go down from the eye socket to the ear. I guess that would make a, a bit more sense. But then you'd think that there'd be a little bit more of a implication of that in the poem. Especially since they make such a big deal about the blood streaming down so that honestly would make a lot more sense if they included just even the most minor hint that they're on top of the other person. I guess just the creepy nature of it, you're supposed to assume <laughs> they've already pinned the other person down. So, yeah, that's that's definitely, <gasps> oh, excuse me, that's definitely one way to look at it wronged. But either way, you start off with that whole bit about the eye being crushed in, tears streaming down, drinking in your cries, so they're not tasting from the eye socket, but licking the tears off of the face, which would be four. Stream down from the eye, down from one to four. After that, later in the poem, the next instance of violence towards the face is biting your tongue, shredding it. So you would go to the mouth, straightforward with that one. Uh, the next part that is mentioned is cheeks, tasty enough to bewitch my tongue but it does not specify if it's the left cheek or right cheek. So it could be seven or it could be nine. So process of elimination, you'd try it, you know, four, eight, and then either seven or nine. And then finally, they mentioned their tender ear and sinking their teeth into it. Um, and they mention that it's the left ear, which would be six. So as long as you can figure out the bullshit for the streaming blood and the right ear being the first part of the face to hit this button, you would at least know First number's four. Second number, the mouth, is eight. You can try seven, and then you can try nine, and then the last number is six. So you just have to do trial and error. You can do four, eight, seven, six, four, eight, nine, six. And ultimately, it winds up being four, eight, nine, six.
again, even with notes, even understanding sort of how you're supposed to look at things to solve this puzzle, I feel like this one still does not really make sense. Like, did Jeremy Blasty ever apologize for this puzzle? No, just the uh, just the Shakespeare one at the very beginning. So yeah, long creepy poem with a lot of sort of uh, red herrings, false things that seem like they're part of a puzzle solution that aren't. Um, and even if you narrow it down to like all of the times where the author is tasting blood, the whole streaming from the eye to the ear thing, very confusing and throws off how you're supposed to view this as you're also supposed to come to the conclusion that you're looking at this keypad as though it were a face without really a whole lot of other clues or hints or anything to let you know that you're doing that. Like, yeah, this is... This is such a a stretch for how you're supposed to, like, come to a conclusion uh, for this puzzle. Never minded this one. At least it gives you enough clues to brute force it. I don't even know about that. Like, it doesn't give you any of the numbers. It doesn't, like say anything about numbers in the poem itself you just sort of get these vague references to parts of a face and that's the only real like recurring theme that you have to go off of on the poem it's already such a like stretch of logic that you're supposed to look at the keypad as a face and which parts of the face to assign to each number on the keypad because there's so many ways that you could do that and do it wrong. You know? There's worse puzzles in the hospital. We still have... Crematorium. Uh, honestly, I like that puzzle more than this one. That one I feel like is is somewhat more solvable from clues compared to look at the keypad as a face even though we don't tell you to and not even really following its own rules for blood streaming and where what part of the face would go to what and what number represents what part of the face. That's the part that always throws me off. Ah. There's a tattoo on its foot. Margaret, let's swear our love until death do us part. The start time is my key. There's a man's corpse laid out on the stretcher. So this man's corpse is, as we will come to find out, a victim of Leonard Wolfe's. So this is another one of those things. I've got a bunch of notes about Leonard written and set aside. And then kind of once we get done getting through Brookhaven... And going over all the information, I'll, I'll try to read over my notes to, to best try to explain Leonard uh, to the best of my abilities. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that have to be made. There's a lot of guesswork involved. Leonard is easily one of the more mysterious characters in the series. He's like one of the only monsters that you hear speak that still appears as a monster. Um... And he's got a complicated relationship with Claudia and the cult. There's a lot of interesting things about Leonard to take into consideration. So, as I said, we'll try to get through a lot of this information. 
And then once we're done with Brookhaven, I'll read out my notes, see what you guys think. There's papers scattered on the floor. Something's written on them, but none of them really seem to be important. There's a medical record here. Could this be for this dead guy? Oh, excuse me. I'm very tired. Background unknown. Name and age unknown. Not admitted patient. Found in poor mental state on hospital grounds and temporarily installed in room M4 at chief's discretion. Died late tonight from blood loss due to severed carotid artery. Damn, just like Walter Sullivan. Was grasping own kitchen knife in right hand. Assume this was cause of neck wound. Possible suicide, but wound angle suspicious. Sent to second floor treatment room for further investigation. Have received no proof or corroboration of event from patient residing in same room. So he was put into a room. He was not an admitted patient to Brookhaven. He was found in poor mental state just near the hospital, and they just took him in and threw him in a room with another patient, that other patient being Leonard Wolf. Have not notified police. However, for future necessity, leave victim's bed and effects intact. Room M4. All right. Ow. Fuck you. Shit. Also fuck you. Nurse design for Brookhaven, totally uh, different from Silent Hill 2. Instead of the bubblehead nurses, we've got these sort of black-haired bob-cut nurses. Similar outfits, uniforms. They've also got that very distinct red square over their mouths. Another Stanley note. Alarm clock. Two fifty. But it's hard mode, so you're supposed to make this PM and standard time or military time, depending on what you call it. So instead of two fifty. We're looking at 1450. So you just take the time, convert it to PM. Attaché case is locked. Plug in 1450. And it's open. Interesting note. As far as uh, a speedrun thing, I'm not sure if I haven't been keeping up with speedruns for Silent Hill for some time. Years ago, I used to speedrun all the whole series. I'm a former world record holder for Silent Hill 3 uh, for multiple categories. And uh, one thing that I saw another runner, a lot of you know Punchy. Uh, through GDQ and like he uh, he pointed out that there's a strat that with this clock notice even though I'm not examining the clock the clock hands are where they're supposed to be like for this this puzzle solution so it's possible to just run over here and zoom the camera in to look at the clock and you could even pause the game if you wanted to cheese the in-game timer while you look and determine what time it is. 
and then plug in the answer without actually looking at it. Because they took the time to make the actual in-game model clock, you know, point at the correct time. Saves a couple seconds, but fucking interesting. Got an instant camera. There's nothing else interesting in the attache case. And our Stanley note. There was a tattooed guy on that rumpled bed. Not anymore, though. That alarm clock and filthy bag are his. Ah, but don't misunderstand. I haven't done a thing. I didn't hate him. Though he was a liar. Shall I write something of my own? On my chest? Since I can't cut it open to show you my heart? I love Heather. No. Something a bit more forceful. I love Heather isn't enough for what I feel. Oh, what tender emotion this image brings. Stanley Coleman. Notes just get fucking worse and worse. Sorry. Excuse me. Didn't mean to intrude. And broken. And broken. Mark everything up. all kind of makes me think of poor Mary from Silent Hill 2. Poor Mary. Well, the doll actually is a Silent Hill character. We get a much better look at it and who it is uh, a little bit later when we find the note where the doll has been broken. So if you haven't seen my playthroughs of this before where I've pointed that out, uh, I will be getting to that point somewhat soon. We have nail polish remover, so we can go get the keys stuck to the wall now. The organization has me shut up in here. They mean to break my will, to make me forget about all that. But I'll stay sane, even if they throw me in here with lunatics. How about if I stick this to the wall? Mm, that would be worthless. You can peel it off, can't you? With that junk, those nasty wenches won't stop using. If a thing has no meaning, there's no reason for it to exist at all. Just as you exist for me. But why haven't you taken my doll with you? Ah, uh, my gift must have embarrassed you. How cute you are, Heather. Stanley Coleman. And again, just for reference. Oops, don't read it again. No, examine the doll. That's why. <laughs> it's a doll from a creepy guy. Creepy stalker. Heather says, disgusting. I won't touch that with a ten-foot pole. I 
I used the nail polish remover and got a stairwell key. So now we can finally, after using the elevator to go from floor to floor, we can go to the stairwell. Whereas at this point in Brookhaven in Sound Hill 2, you're using the stairwell to go from floor to floor and you'd have the elevator key. Uh, I am playing the official PC release. Um, there is no official place to download this game digitally. You have to already own a physical copy. Or, you know, it's the internet. Sometimes people put things on it that you can find with search engines and then download. Good luck. Freaky wheelchair, specifically very reminiscent of a creaky wheelchair in Silent Hill 1 that we find in the alleyway, the nightmare sequence at the very beginning. Very, very reminiscent. Submachine gun bullets, because we're about to get our SMG. a wheelchair. Where's the person that was using it? Uh, context clues. There's bullet shells, casings everywhere. A lot of blood. Moving away from the chair. Bullet holes, gun on ground, bullet holes, handprints, and elevator. The blood trail continues into the elevator. Part of me wants to peek in, but then it's a little creepy too. So we'll just take our free gun and not think about it too hard. Streaks of blood as if something got dragged are continuing onto the back of the shelf. No, it's more like they start from the back of the shelf. There's a suspicious space between the shelf and the wall. But I can't squeeze into there, and there's no way I can move the shelf either. Well, we'll just stick this instant camera back there. Unlike a normal camera, you can see the developed photos right away. Four eight nine. That electrical sound of like the lights buzzing and stuff in here. Creepy. Also, does that box say slort? Don't 
Don't forget your box of slurt. Second floor, we went through. Spooky noise. Um. Hmm. So, another door, another keypad. This is the code from behind the shelf, 1489. Much more practical puzzle solutions here than keypad faces. Would you say this is your favorite Silent Hill game? This is my second favorite Silent Hill game right behind Silent Hill 2. Two's my favorite. It's very close for three. Um, like two and three are... are Excellent. Some of my favorite game, most favorite games ever. Um, but yeah, Dark Fantasy beat me to it. Exclamation point faves in chat to see how I rank the games. So. Yep. Um, stun gun battery, health drinks. Isn't there supposed to be a Stanley note in here? Maybe I have to read the roof one first. note disappears after you get the basement code um but the you don't get to this area until you have that basement code no matter what i'm guessing it's probably just after this other note okay it's probably after this one it's either after this one or the roof one Flowing freely, your ebony hair like the night sky, scattering fragrance. My heart, clamoring in my chest like a storm, you trifle with it. Your pristine glance, like a feast when you smile. My thoughts disturbed, my breath like opium, it drives me mad. Eric. A great poet who conveys my feelings so well. Everyone knows great poet Eric. I shouldn't have let this place get to me. Should never have gone crazy. But it's superbly enjoyable to drown in my love for you. But why won't you accept proof of my love? Don't stand on ceremony now. After all, you and I exist as one. What I give to you is the same as what I give to me. Stanley Coleman. <laughs> wow, look at all these Origins defenders. <laughs> Not even really or defending, just... Um, my big issue with Origins is that it touted itself as a prequel and then got basically all of the story elements of Silent Hill 1 wrong. For what's supposed to be a prequel to Silent Hill 1. Like, say what you will about Homecoming or Downpour. They at least tried to do original stories. Like, they tried to do something new that wasn't fucking up lore from existing previous games. Whereas Origins, like, straight up the first thing you see is 
Dahlia's house on fire. And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> All these things are not adding up. I played Silent Hill 1. And Origins is not following the story correctly. But it's calling itself a prequel. And then it caused a lot of arguing for between fans for many, many years who took all the things that Origin said and used that as their way of interpreting events in Silent Hill 1. And it's just like, it's made by people who had no idea what they were writing, who had to rush a game out with half the time and half the budget. There's just... There's so many things wrong with Origins that on top of it, final product being a pretty fucking mediocre game, it's also kind of an insult to Silent Hill 1. So I can deal with a game just being a mediocre or bad game on its own and at least trying to do something sort of original. It's the worst of both. It's, it's, a, it's a bad mediocre game for the new things that it adds and the stuff that it tries to build off of and tout itself as a prequel make me hate it that much more. Should have the roof note here. Yep. I also like the rooftop. It makes me want to fly. You too. Stanley Coleman. Now. The storeroom one here. Crap. The roof note's gone. All the notes disappear after reading them and then leaving the room. If you go back to any of them, they're just gone. Just a normal screen. Ah, oh God. Doesn't look like it's about to do stuff. It doesn't look like it's about to break and fall. Specifically referencing that it breaks and falls in Silent Hill 2. Mostly because pyramid head smashes you through it but uh cool little bit of text there little silent hill 2 reference do one more check for this note in here all right Noticed all the Silent Hill 2 Easter eggs on PC are only available on New Game Plus except the mall toilet one. Yeah, that's weird to me. I was noticing that the Silent Hill 2 Easter egg, the, the mailbox one, wasn't working. And I know I've had that working in the past with this same set of mods that I'm using. So I, I kind of figured it was like a New Game Plus thing. But um, yeah, it's so weird that you'd have... that not working but the toilet like the very first one working health drinks magazine just some kind of gossip magazine teaching despair hope house so i've i've kind of got a little bit of a theory on on this this is a magazine that we find in silent hill 4 and as we found out 
uh, as I found out through researching these games and learning about like the development and stuff behind them, um, based on their release dates and based on when they were, you know, working on these games, you can find out that they were simultaneously working on Silent Hill 3 and Silent Hill 4. Like, 3 was started in production first, and then not too long after 3 had started being developed, they had members of Team Silent, the non-core members, B-team members, basically, of Team Silent, start working on a side project called Room 302 at the same time as Silent Hill 3. Room 302 was supposed to be an experiment in doing things very different from how Silent Hill had already been for the first three games. They wanted to play around with some new mechanics, um, com you know, new combat stamina systems, uh, limited item inventory, um, recurring world hub, uh, lots of different little things that they wanted to test, or, you know, test out in like a separate game, a separate side project. And eventually, Konami said this would be much more marketable as a Silent Hill game. So Room 302 became Silent Hill 4. So Silent Hill 3, Silent Hill 4 were being worked on very, very closely uh, together. A lot of team members bouncing back and forth uh, between the two projects and then your core B team people focusing on four, uh, with your core members focusing on three. And I feel like this was something maybe added kind of late into the Silent Hill 3 development, like they went back and placed this after finishing a lot of other stuff with three, close to when it was done or almost done with development, as a way to sort of tie four in. Um... So that's one of those ones where maybe be this was like more of a marketing thing. They needed more ways to make sure that four tied into the rest of the series. And by sticking this note here and then putting this exact same note almost word for word uh, with one exception in Silent Hill 4 gives a nice little link between the two. Um... The one thing that changed is the name of the orphanage. So Hope House becomes Wish House. And there could be a couple of things that could be the cause of this. Um, one thing that Jeremy Blastine has talked about is that a lot of times if he's got to translate things multiple times that are the same from game to game, sometimes things will get translated a little bit differently. So Japanese word could be translated one time as hope and another time as wish. There's also my kind of pet theory on this. There is an actual organization it's not specifically an orphanage, but it's an organization for, like, finding homes for orphans that's based out of, I want to say, Ukraine, that's called Hope House. That's been around for decades, like, since this game was developed. And... It's very possible they could have made this note first, put this in, called it Hope House, and then Silent Hill 4 rolls around. This game comes out. Silent Hill 4 is, is getting, you know, produced more and is further along in development. They do a little bit of research and discover there's an actual Hope House. Uh... And then out of respect for this, this real organization changes it to Wish House for Silent Hill 4. Um, so Dude Man, yeah, they are uh, both translated by Jeremy Blaustein. But again, he's working on a lot of different things at the same time. He may have been told to trans by somebody else to 
to translate something in a particular way. He's said himself that sometimes he interprets translations of certain things differently. There's things that he's talked about that he kind of wishes he had phrased differently or translated differently, localized differently. Um, so who knows? There's, there's a couple different things that, that could have happened here with this. But anyway, Teaching Despair Hope House. Hope House, an orphanage on the outskirts of Silent Hill, but behind its false image is a place where children are kidnapped and brainwashed. Hope House is managed by the Silent Hill Smile Support Society, a charity organization sometimes called 4S. It's true that 4S is a well-respected charity that takes in poor children without homes and raises them with hope. But at its heart, it is a heathen organization that teaches its own warped dogma in lieu of good religious values. Mr. Smith, temp, who lives near Hope House, had this to say. Sometimes at night I can hear their weird prayers and the sounds of children crying. I went there to complain one time, but they ran me right out. Since then, it hasn't changed a bit. In fact, this reporter was refused admission when he attempted to take photographs in the facility. What exactly do the folks at Hope House have to hide? During my investigations, I was able to discover, however, a suspicious-looking round concrete tower, which appears to be part of their facilities. That's the water tower, their water prison uh, area of Silent Hill 4. Unfortunately, no one was willing to tell us what the tower was used for, but it seems unlikely that it has anything to do with the business of raising orphans. It may, in fact, be a prison or a secret place of worship. The cult religion that operates Hope House is known by the locals simply as the Order. This is big that this is included in Silent Hill 3, and that it's just like a th an article published in a, in a magazine. So by this point, like for the events of Silent Hill 1, Lisa talks about how only the locals really know about the Order, and even then not all of them. They're a very underground thing that some people are aware of. They know some people in town are part of it, but a lot of people aren't aren't as aware. And it's basically only those those couple locals and stuff that know about it, and then the cult members themselves. It's supposed to be completely secretive for the most part. By this point, this is an older article that is published by Joseph Schrieber, the, uh, the journalist uh, who plays a main, major role in Silent Hill 4. So he's already done a whole big story on it, expose, and it's public knowledge now. People know about the town, people know about the cult, which could have something to do with like how much more abandoned it became. But it's interesting that they, that this would be like public information now. People know about this cult, the Order. It's a religion that is deeply interwoven with Silent Hill's history, but its worshippers' fervent belief that they are among the elite chosen people has a dark and dangerous side. I intend to continue my investigation of Hope House and the cult behind it. I've always believed that telling the whole truth and showing the children the true path is our most important duty. Joseph Schrieber Hope House I feel like I've heard that name before. So again, as we will find out in information in Silent Hill 4, which would have been being worked on more or less side by side by Silent Hill 3, that Alessa and Dahlia have connections to Hope House, a.k.a. Wish House, and that Alessa was possibly one of the orphans of this orphanage, that she wasn't actually the blood relative of Dahlia Gillespie. Instead, that they would take these children and basically force them to read and practice rituals and and learn their beliefs and kind of in, induct them into the cult and that they would specifically 
look for children that had latent abilities, latent psychic abilities, such as Walter Sullivan or Alessa Gillespie. So, little weird hints between three and four because of this this article. Uh, I said they change the title, like the name of the orphanage itself. Uh, get that little line from Heather about um, how it sounds familiar to her, which is insinuating that it's one of her past memories uh, from her life as Alessa. So, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's one of those things that there's so many different ways to try and interpret this information, why it was done that way. Okay, so we're at this point. The doll has been broken, and we will now see what Silent Hill character this doll is, who, who it represents. The doll is all torn apart. It's really pretty sad to look at. I wonder who did it anyway. Look at the doll's head. That's Harry's face texture from Silent Hill 1. Goodbye, Heather. I'm sorry I wasn't able to respond to your love. It's all over. Leonard despises me. Because I made fun of it, saying it would come to this. If it weren't for his meddling, I would have been able to meet you in just a little while. Then I could have taken you to my world. A world for us alone more beautiful than this one. <clears throat> and I had been waiting for this day, for today. The day I'd see you, the day you'd save me. Today. Heather, watch out for him. Leonard is no ordinary guy. Farewell. I loved you. Heather, my goddess. Heather, my lover. Heather, my... And that's all from Stanley. All right. Time to talk to the big man himself, Claudia's father, Leonard Wolf. Hello? Claudia. No, I'm not... Don't lie to me, Claudia. You're always trying to run from your responsibilities. Have you come to apologize? Or maybe you still don't realize how foolish you've been. The salvation of all mankind. Ah, what a ridiculous dream. Wait, just listen to me for a second. I've heard enough from you already. How did you turn out this way? Where did I go wrong? Listen to me already. I'm not Claudia. You're not Claudia. My name is Heather. Heather. 
Who are you? Leonard Wolf. I'm sorry. I thought you were my daughter. Claudia is your daughter? Oh, so you know her, do you? Are you one of her followers? No, never. When I find her, I I'm... I can feel the hatred. What? Behind your words, the anger. You plan to kill her, don't you? I'm sorry. killed my father. She's a fool. But she's still my daughter. I was going to forgive her if she changed her ways. But I see it's too late. Heather, will you help me? Help you? I'm locked up in here. And I must stop Claudia. Where are you now? Not sure myself, but the door is at the end of the hall on the second floor. I think I can be of help to you. I have a seal. Please. A seal? Okay, so there's enough enough info with Leonard at this point that I kind of want to try and read through some of my notes and explain like that conversation and some other stuff a little bit more now. So these are some notes that I made years ago, uh, little little bits and pieces at a time, and then over the years kind of compiled them and cleaned them up tried to make them make a little bit more sense to me, the way that evidence is presented throughout Brookhaven uh, as far as Leonard himself. So, yeah. This is the most I can try to, like, piece together, because Leonard is seriously one of the most mysterious characters uh, in these games. Leonard Wolfe was known to have been a patient of Brookhaven Hospital, admitted some time after stabbing a person over a religious dispute, and is known to try to push his fervent beliefs of the Order's religion onto the patients and staff of the mental hospital. A victim of a slashing can be found in Brookhaven's examining room, with a note nearby stating that although it appears as a suicide, the wound angle is suspicious. This man was a victim of Leonard's after a confrontation over religious beliefs as well. On the victim's body, Margaret, till death do we part, can be seen, a traditional saying rooted in Catholicism during marriage, so we know that he and Leonard would have very opposing views on God. The happy birthday caller, which we'll get to shortly, also proclaims that he is not Leonard, stating, that's the murderer's name, in reference to Leonard being a murderer, just to confirm that he was a killer. And that, you know, there's p paperwork, notes that we find in the hospital, talking about him stabbing people and getting argumentative and, and uh, violent over religious disputes. You find the person stabbed to death, who was in his room, with... Till death do we part, you know, I said Catholicism uh, saying during marriage. So he probably would have had a more traditional view on God, which would not have sat well with Leonard. Um, later, in the Otherworld Brookhaven, in this same room, we find a body hanging from the ceiling that's been stabbed in the chest with a copper stake and bled out into a bucket below, which must be collected in order to later perform a ritual. This is Leonard's first victim. 
So the guy that we saw with the tattoo on him was a later victim of Leonard's after he was already admitted. The guy we see hanging when we get to the other world uh, version of Brookhaven with his blood being drained into a bucket was the first victim of Leonard's that got him sent to Brookhaven in the first place. At one point, Leonard manages to call a phone in a patient room and begins talking as though he is speaking to his daughter, Claudia Wolf. This is likely a form of communication common between the two, the phone acting as a vessel for the two to speak via psychic ability and thus is able to be used by Heather with her latent psychic abilities as well. Leonard begins by responding to Heather harshly, thinking that it's Claudia lying about her identity to avoid responsibility for something and implies Claudia has behaved this way before to his disapproval. He goes on to ask, have you come to apologize? Or maybe you don't realize how foolish you've been. The salvation of all mankind. Ha, what a ridiculous dream. This gives the impression Claudia and Leonard have discussed their personal beliefs within their faith as opposing views many times already. Leonard believes the unnecessary people must be killed off, leaving behind only the followers of the cult, whereas Claudia seeks salvation for all mankind via total extermination at the hands of their god, a world cleansed by fire. So they disagree on their, their beliefs within the cult. Leonard thinks that cultists are the chosen ones. They're supposed to kill all the other people who are not believers, and they themselves will still be around. Claudia thinks everyone needs to go. Cult member, non-cult member, doesn't matter. Just cleanse the world in fire. Everyone goes. His standing disappointment in her can be inferred by his di his dialogue. How did you turn out this way? Where did I go wrong? Finally, after shouting and forcing Leonard to listen, Heather convinces him that she is not Claudia. Much to Leonard's surprise based on his tone, and he reveals he is, in fact, Leonard Wolf. Heather reveals she is looking for Claudia, and Leonard can sense her intent to kill her. While at first he seems indifferent to this, he replies, She is a fool, but she's still my daughter. I was going to forgive her if she changed her ways. Showing that at some level, Leonard did still care for his daughter Claudia. After this realization, Leonard chooses instead to ask Heather for her help, in freeing him from Brookhaven, revealing that he's locked up in here and wishes to also stop Claudia. However, when Heather asks for his location, Leonard states he's not sure, but mentions a door at the end of the hallway of the second floor, which prior to this conversation did not exist. He goes on to tell Heather that he can be of help to her, since he possesses a seal, the seal of Metatron, which when used by someone of great faith like Leonard himself, can be a powerful tool for delaying the effects of the other world on reality and stalling the birth of the cult's god. We see that effect of the Metatron used in Silent Hill 1 by Alessa in order to try and stave off the other world from spreading. When returning to the second floor hallway, an unmarked door now appears where previous to Leonard's mention was not there, perhaps an example of the town's power manifesting something or changing reality only once they have knowledge or belief in it. This door leads to the other world's Brookhaven. A notebook from Leonard can be found on the first floor day room, stating, The world is teeming with unnecessary people. It's God's decision that I fight. As a knight of honor, as a protector of the seal, I sacrifice myself to the blood of criminals. Leonard's victims, who he saw as criminals for not believing in the cult's faith, 
were the unnecessary people to him. Leonard will sacrifice himself for their blood, in his own words. This has two meanings. Leonard sacrifices his freedom by becoming detained and confined in Brookhaven for murder. But he will also literally sacrifice his life later to the player's own hands in exchange for the blood of his victim. All that's left is the ritual itself, to be performed in Leonard's room on the first floor of the Otherworld Brookhaven. A book titled Lost Memories, a reference to Heather's own lost memories of her life as Alessa, can be found on a table in this room. It reads, One characteristic mentioned only in rare documents and dying out in the modern age is that of the ritual sacrifice. Offering prayers, pierce a man's chest with a copper stake, drench the altar in the blood which spouts red from the heart, to praise and to show loyalty unto God. The book mentions sacrifice just as Leonard had mentioned in his own notebook. Leonard had performed his own sacrifice in Brookhaven, his own ritual, in a show of loyalty to his God, and now the player, as Heather, must repeat the same ritual using the knowledge gained from the book, the victim's blood, and a combination of the town's power and her own latent psychic abilities. The altar is prepared, and once you apply Leonard's victim's blood, a hole and ladder down into a watery chamber appear. Leonard Wolf has sacrificed his freedom out of loyalty to his god, and has been given a new, horrible yet powerful form during his incarceration within the Otherworld to act as the, the protector of the Seal of Metatron, one of the few things that could potentially prevent the birth of God. Leonard Wolf is here, confined to the Otherworld with the Seal of Metatron, hidden behind a ritual of his own faith by Claudia in order to distance the powerful item from her and her plans. As, as long as Claudia knows that he has the seal, as long as he is confined to Brookhaven, she doesn't have to really worry about the seal of Metatron. It's not in the hands of somebody who has great faith in the cult's belief like Leonard. So as long as that's not the case, it won't have any effect in the hands of somebody else. Leonard has taken on a monstrous new form during his time in the other world, Yet through his psychic abilities, he is still able to communicate to Heather. As Heather explains her stance, Leonard becomes aware that Heather herself is not a follower of his faith, and thus sees her as a criminal, a heretic, who plans to use the seal of Metatron to destroy his god, the god to whom he swore loyalty and sacrificed himself. Leonard then attacks, and Heather must defend herself, ultimately killing Leonard. After Leonard has been killed, the other world subsides and Heather awakens in Leonard's room in the normal world and discovers the seal of Metatron left behind and no trace of Leonard remains. Upon leaving Brookhaven, we see a scene of Claudia and Vincent talking to each other, Claudia expressing that she's upset that Vincent revealed the location of Leonard and sent Heather to him, knowing and even counting on the outcome of Leonard's death. Claudia tells him, it's your fault that he... Showing slight remorse towards the death of her father, despite their oppositions to each other. After this, Vincent reveals the nature of Leonard Wolfe in the past, having been witness to the abuse Claudia endured at his hand. So like I said, it's a little bit disjointed because those are different little pieces of like ideas and thoughts about information surrounding Leonard and things that you find throughout Brookhaven and all these little things that are mentioned in cutscenes um, over the course of years of playing this game and kind of trying to figure out more stuff about Leonard. And then I just kind of compiled all those notes into one large note and, and tried to clean it up. So that's like the best way that I can kind of explain what's going on with Leonard, with Claudia, their relationship, uh, Leonard being here, 
Leonard having the appearance, uh, the ritual that he performed, um, what he's doing as the guardian of the seal, what his intentions are, um, how that doesn't line up with Claudia's intentions or Heather's for that matter. It's a lot of little things just kind of pieced together bit by bit over years and put into notes. So that's the best I can I can really explain that. So we just need to go to the door that just appeared, that wasn't there before. Second floor, end of the hallway. Movie never explains Leonard at all. Well, Silent Hill Revelations is trash and not really a good representation of these games at all anyway. Neither of the movies is a good representation of the games. They're very much their own thing. They they change a lot. But CGI in the movies are good and the makeup. Clueless Corgi I will pull up a screenshot of the mannequin spider monster from Revelations right now. And we'll let however many hundreds of people are here watching judge how good that CGI looks in real time. I don't mean to call you out like this, but anybody who defends Revelations to any degree, you're, you're asking for it. I already have this. Oh my god, why? Why doesn't it work? I was trying to show it like actually animating. I'll just show like the still shot, I guess. Yes, why are you being weird? Why are none of my images like going correctly now?
That's some good CGI. I don't think the CGI barbed wire in the first is any worse than that, though. And all the CGI bugs. Especially when you see the CGI bugs, like, up close with their little faces. Ugh. Looks fine, just cartoonish, which is why I imagine it's considered to be bad. I mean... Yes, it's in an otherwise realistically shot and and filmed movie next to like real human characters. And it just even for the time looks pretty fucking rough. Anyway. When was the movie released again? 2006 was the first one. Uh, 2008? 2009? Was Revelations? Two thousand twelve. Holy shit. I was in 2012. I didn't realize it was that many years after. But I guess so, yeah, because it's got the stupid... It's got the stupid ending. <laughs> the downpour ending. So, yeah... The downpour slash origins ending. Where Travis Grady's truck drives right past uh, Murphy Pendleton's prison bus. That's like the last shot of Revelations. Hey, a seal of Metatron. It's not a save point. It's not the halo of the sun. Distinct and different symbol. This picture, this one doesn't make my head hurt when I look at it. But I know this one. It must be... Still has an unusually high fever. Eyes don't open. Getting a pulse. But just barely breathing. Why? What is keeping that child alive? Sadly, there is no Silent Hill 1 voice audio in the PC version because of that scene right there. For anybody who missed me talking about it earlier, real quick, I'll go over it again. So, Silent Hill 3 got made. They used a lot of audio clips from Silent Hill 1. Uh, the PS2 version came out, and... One of the voice actresses, uh, it was brought to her attention that, hey, your voice is being used in that new Silent Hill game. Uh, so Thessaly Lerner, the voice for Lisa in the original Silent Hill, she was made aware. She was like, I never said anything about them using my voice. There was never anything in my contract about like being used in other games. So rightfully... She figured she had a case and was going to take it to court with Konami. She approached Konami first before going to court 
and they apparently settled out of court for a couple thousand dollars. So she got paid, and Konami, just to be sure that none of the other voice actors tried to come and do the same thing, just removed the audio out of the PC version, subsequent releases right afterwards. And they sure put the voiceover back in the HD collection version. Yeah, did they? <laughs> oh, boy. But yeah. So, Konami settled out of court, and the voice, act, uh, the voice lines from Silent Hill 1 all got pulled for the PC version. What the hell? Was I daydreaming? No, it was more like watching a video in a dark room. But that nurse, I know her. Lisa, who was so heavenly toward me in that hellish hospital room. She did get a little weird, though. Just a little. Just a little weird. We're about to see our man Valtiel. There's our Alessa's shrieking insanity mouth yet again. Some text written in blood on that wall. It says, what a wonderful world. And it's kind of hard to see here. You can see it a little bit from below. But there's like a, a worm tentacle thing coming out from under this bed. And you can see it a little bit, like, right as you climb up. See it right at the very bottom of the screen, like, wiggling around. Little details about things here that are, like, so hard to catch. There's no way to alter the camera without, like, cam hacks and stuff. And see that any clearer. Valtiel himself. Spin in that valve. Our transitionary period here from real world to actual other world. A nurse. A nurse named Fukuro. There's a whole special animation about her in Pyramid Head. Fukuro lady. I guess she's not technically named Fukuro, the short. The video is named Fukuro, it's titled Fukuro. I just always reference her as Fukuro, but yeah. Fukuro lady. If you come out here and immediately look to the side, you can see Fukuro lady getting dragged in by Valtiel. Very easy to miss. It goes by so quick if you don't just immediately come over here and look. They'll be gone. Oh boy. Who's Fukuro? Um, look up Fukuro on YouTube. There's a... There's like an animated music video type thing that Team Silent made for Silent Hill 2 called Fukuro. And, uh, yeah, there's that. Who's Valtiel again? Valtiel is one of the deities of, that the cult believes in. He's the caretaker of the Mother of God. And sort of the overseer of the other world.
It's so hard to see doors with this texture. Blood. A bucket absolutely filled to the fucking brim with blood. And a dead guy. The mutilated, like, head and face on this guy reminds me a lot of the corpses in Silent Hill 2 that resemble James. It's not quite the same, but kind of similar. Don't get a camera angle of uh, the other side. There's a dead body hanging from the ceiling. The blood dripping from it has totally filled the bucket set out below. Who would do this? And for what? Looks like a full-out bloodletting. Isn't Valtiel Heather's guardian of some sort? I mean, that's what I meant when I said he's the caretaker of the Mother of God. That's Heather. Love this, just this heat effect in this room. Good camera angles, good creepy visual stuff without a whole lot of like other things going on. I like a lot of things in this game and in the series in general that are just sort of like good, creepy visual things that you don't really have, like you can pick apart and definitely analyze a lot closer, but some things I just like to appreciate as fucking creepy. Ah, fuck. Stop. Stop. Faked me out. dead. Thank you. Make a save here. And enjoy one of the coolest rooms in Silent Hill 3. Let's try and get an awesome anime katana swing. Oh, she's already stopped. Oh yeah, you totally die, obviously. Absolutely. But I just like showing it. That's why I made the save.
Valtiel's like Pyramid Head's brother? No, not really. They share some design similarities. That's about it. Is Pyramid Head worshipped by the Order? No, not really. Pyramid Head is a manifestation resembling the old executioners, but is more of a specific representation of punishment and guilt for James in Silent Hill 2. He's not specific to the cult. Ah. Time for a tale about Cox. So, of course, crematorium here, it's locked. We need to figure out the combination to get in. And this is a pretty big puzzle. There's a main poem and then several smaller poems that we have to go around and read on like each of the beds and stuff. Um, but there's also something I want to show here. Oh, fuck. Um, I think it'll still work if I approach it now, even though I haven't done the happy birthday call. Let's do this in a little different order. Because I want to do the call first, and then we'll come back to this. Full uh, imagery here. There's Valtiel again doing uh, doing things to Fukuro Lady. Specifically, not fucking. Masahiro Ito said no fucking. Well, he said that about Pyramid Head in Silent Hill 2. <laughs> looks like something's on the other side of the glass. Kind of looks like a person. But this smoky stuff makes it hard to tell for sure. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear. Oh, I forgot your name. Who are you? Oh, okay, thanks. Happy birthday, dear, who are you? Happy birthday to you. Happy 31st birthday! Is this Leonard? That's the murderer's name, not my name. 
I'm not your beloved Stanley either. He's underground now. His new name is Number Seven. <laughs> but don't worry about that now. It's time to celebrate your birthday. You've got me mistaken for someone else. Today's not my... I'm not mistaken. Today is your 24th birthday. And I have a present for you. Which do you prefer? To give pain or to receive it? You can have the one you hate the most. <laughs> Happy birthday to you! But you're wrong. It's not my birthday. I mean, it is kind of your birthday. It's Silent Hill 3's birthday. Been 18 years as of yesterday, as of the 23rd, which is when I started this playthrough. <laughs> but yesterday was the 18th year since Silent Hill 3 released. Any explanation on who's making the call? Nope. He is simply known as the happy birthday caller. It's could be another patient of Brookhaven most likely, but specifically goes out of their way to say they're not Stanley. They're not Leonard. Um, your guess is as good as mine. But he does give us some good, interesting information. So... Leonard Wolf. That's the murderer's name. Just to kind of confirm some of those notes I was reading earlier about Leonard, that he was the killer. He stabbed the guy uh, and tried to make it look like suicide. Uh, the numbers that he gives for Heather's birthday, happy, you know, whatever. So he's adding the ages that Alessa, Cheryl, and Heather all are together. So Heather in this game is 17, combined with Cheryl's age of 7, gives us the 24, happy 24th. And then it's Alessa's age of 14 combined with Heather's age of 17, which is the 31. So happy 31st birthday, happy 24th birthday is basically combining Alessa's age at death plus Heather's age and Cheryl's age at I guess it's not really death or soul reuniting is this just an easter egg or do the ages have any more relevance to the story I mean that in itself is a big part of the story Heather's re like this reincarnation of Alessa Alessa's soul was split into Cheryl um in Silent Hill 1, like, it's all about the other half of Alessa's soul coming back to Silent Hill, reuniting, the god attempting to be born, being forced out, uh, being killed by Harry Mason, Alessa dies in this process but reincarnates again into a small baby, that small baby is given to Harry, Harry escapes from Silent Hill with it, 17 years after that ending of Silent Hill are the events of this game, so... Those numbers, taking the numbers into account as 
you know, they're all part of Heather is, is a big part of her character and, and the overall plot. The phone booth ringing in the subway, also the same caller? Leaves you the first present in the form of the shotgun, or is that just overthinking? I'd say a little bit of overthinking there. I mean, there's... If there was more evidence to suggest that it's the same person, then sure, but... I mean, phones are just a thing. We also talked to Leonard Wolf on the phone earlier, and this person goes out of their way to say that they're not Leonard. Um, yeah, I don't know. It could be. I'm not saying it absolutely isn't, but there's not really evidence to say one way or the other. Something strange and it cooped up. Uh, something strange is cooped up in the locker. I think I'm safe, but I shouldn't get too close. Actually, the more I look at it, the more pitiful it seems. Like a child locked up in there with no chance of escape. Child locked up with no chance of escape. And Heather sort of takes pity on it. Probably reminding her of Alessa. So now that we've listened to the happy birthday caller and he tells us he's not Leonard and he's not Stanley and he goes on to explain with Stanley that he's underground now and his new name is number seven. So now we're going to go underground. There were numbers written on each of the uh, each of the beds in the crematorium. One of which is number seven. And I'm going to turn up the game audio because this sound can be pretty hard to hear. I'm going to mute my mic so that nothing else should be coming through. And just listen what happens when you approach bed number seven, which would be Stanley, the, the, the one who's obsessed with Heather and was leaving all the, the diaries and the doll and thing for her. Listen close. Yeah. He starts getting excited. Because Heather is so close to him. Even in death. Pies bra. Pies bra. Thank you so much for that prime sub. Appreciate the support. Thank you, thank you. Oh, boy. Let me pull up notes to explain this puzzle. And then we've got a lot of poems to read.
Okay. So we have our main poem. <coughs> main poem to read. So we start with that, and then we'll go through everything that's written on each of the beds, explain kind of how you're supposed to find the solution here, and solve the puzzle. Burn the one who knows no death, pure, adored by those above, no prayers within, just simple love. And now the pining hunter, the flames longing for his rebirth, a distant breath within the earth. Burn up that heavy body of his, make it wind, dancing in the sky. That bottomless gut, now a cloud, now a sigh. Keep in mind that, uh, that sigh somewhat similar to the noise, well, kind of, that Stanley made when we approached his bed. The sweet blood on his laughing lips now calls him to the gates of hell. There burns evermore that soulless shell. Four bodies return to ashes. Thus the door is opened. Thus the door is opened. So we need to pick four bodies which each are numbered to get the four digit code to open the lock and get the key that we need. And each of the bodies is going to have a poem on them, each of the beds. And basically we just need to read these and figure out which ones correlate to the first few verses of the main central poem. Uh, Undead Maiden asks, why did Team Silent let Westerners take over anyways? That's what happened, right. It's not like they just let them. Um, Konami put Team Silent together to make Silent Hill games. They made four of them, and Konami disbanded Team Silent. There were several members of Team Silent that were planning on leaving anyway. A few of them left after three. Uh, some of them left after one. And just a lot of the core members had other things. Konami wanted to put them onto other projects. As I said, some of them were going to work for uh, other studios. And uh, yeah, the, the team just sort of disbanded. Um, after that, Konami was looking for cheaper ways to kind of produce games and outsource uh, a lot of their major titles and stuff to other studios. And Silent Hill was just one of those franchises that got outsourced to different studios. So the first one that got made outside of uh, Team Silent being disbanded was Origins. It was originally sent to Climax UK, uh, or excuse me, Climax Los Angeles. They sent it to the US. They started working on a game that was so bad that Konami said, Stop doing what you're doing. And we're sending it to your UK branch. And they have to start over. But they still have the remainder of the budget. And the remainder of the deadline. So they scrapped everything that they had done for Origins originally. And started over when it got sent to Climax UK with the leftover budget after the first failed attempt and the same deadline. The deadline wound up getting extended, but yeah. The original one was looking very Resident Evil 4 and the plans for the story were very different. Uh, one of the directors ha in an interview mentioned that uh, one of the main inspirations for the original idea for Origins was based on the TV show Scrubs. And that it was supposed to be more of a dark comedy. So Konami must have seen this progress and was like, no. We're sending this to Climax UK and they're just going to start over. So they sent the project to Climax UK they took over, 
tried to make it more of a traditional game uh but still had to finish it very quickly you know with not a whole lot of budget and i mean all things considered origins could have turned out much worse than it did it's still like one of my least favorites in the series but yeah and then pretty much that trend just kind of continued uh for the rest of the series Konami would just outsource the project to other development teams. They did the same thing for Homecoming. They they were they gave it to Double Helix. Um, Shattered Memories, which was given to Climax again. Um. So yeah, they they just it was cheaper for them to outsource it to other studios, and pretty much the only consistent thing about the series after the fact was Akira Yamaoka was still around which of course he was he does work for Konami just all over not just for Silent Hill like outside of Silent Hill before he was doing stuff for Silent Hill he did stuff for a lot of other Konami games he did a lot of stuff for um, Dance Dance Revolution and uh, all sorts of other things uh, so Yamaoka was still around for most of that, except for Downpour. And then Tom, yeah, Tom Hewlett, um, who was around on most of those projects. Although in Origins, he was he was very, like, barely involved. He got a lot more involved with, like, Homecoming and Onward, but even then... It wasn't until like Shattered Memories and Downpour and HD Collection and Book of Memories. Those are all the main ones where Tom had like more more of a a role in the game's productions. Okay. So we read our main poem. Uh go through and read all these poems on each bed we've got a lot to go through with this puzzle there's a memo here let's see who killed cock robin the sparrow they said he wants them all dead to him honey sweet is their sobbing memo here the grass the thrush so loved to eat Gave him sweet happiness. He sank ever deeper and finally fell to destruction and fatal distress. Memo here. The one on Stanley. He seeks out her soul by his own black ambition, frightening her out of her wits, whispering love songs into her ear. What cruel Lynette wants, he gets. Very suiting for Stanley. Memo here on the empty bed. Cock Robin, who hid the key away, is ash in the oven, all right. The place he held is empty now, and the doors remain shut tight. The black rook is the playing sort who hears the gods in the skies. His whispered petitions go on without end. Glassy and dim are his eyes. The lark's child lost all his words and walled himself up all away. Heart and mouth both locked up tight in a cage where none want to stay. The wren, with pure heart as yet unrefined, makes us laugh with his feeble lips smacking. But still we all know he shall never grow old, and he knows not how much he is lacking. The owl, who forgot the sky, resigned to his poor earthbound state. Hungry or full, didn't matter at all. He ate 
an e8, e8. The dove's hope died. He chose his path. His flapping wings fell still. Drenched in scarlet, here they lay, his cheeks pale, white, and chill. The kite, hot, crazy, and panting mad, sweet shackles that tease and excite. Death itself would drive him wild, red blood that turns milky white. Now that we've kind of read all of those, one more time we'll go through this. Burn the one who knows no death, pure, adored by those above. No prayers within, just simple love. So bed number nine, which was the Song of the Wren, had the word pure in it, same as this, first verse. In uh, the Song of the Wren, it says, He shall never grow old, which would mean he knows no death. So, knows no death, the link of both poems being the only two that have the word pure, gives you the first digit bed number nine now the pining hunter the flames longing for his rebirth a distant breath within the earth so song of the owl uh, who is resigned to his earthbound state again we have that consistent word usage between the poem on the bed and this verse of the main poem. Pining hunter, owl is a predatory bird. The flames longing for his rebirth, a distant breath within the earth. So we have that connection of the word and the reference to the owl itself. So... This one would be the owl, which was bed number two. We have nine, two. Uh, third verse, burn up that heavy body of his, make it wind dancing in the sky. That bottomless gut, now a cloud, now a sigh. So because this is Stanley's bed, number seven, we have some references to that. The bottomless gut, now a cloud, now a sigh. Uh, bottomless gut being sort of the reference to him being sort of insatiable. The fact that he's more constant. Uh, how he's consistently craving Heather and obsessed. Burn up the heavy body of his, make it wind, dancing in the sky. There's also a note from Stanley when we went and checked near the roof that mentions uh, he likes being up there, that it reminds him of flying. So... We get that sigh as well, a bottomless gut, now a cloud, now a sigh. Kind of that sigh, that, that choking sound that he made as you approach his body the first time. So this is all references to Stanley, which would be bed number seven. Underground now, new names number seven. Finally, the sweet blood on his laughing lips now calls him to the gates of hell. There burns evermore that soulless shell.
most likely this is going to be a reference to the sparrow so bed number one song of the sparrow mentions that or alludes to him being the murderer this like killer that does not care would be laughing and is then called to the gates of hell for what he's done so finally bed number one that would give us nine two seven one for our four digit combination four bodies returned to ashes thus the door is opened See, this one, at the very least, the stuff about Stanley is kind of vague. The stuff about the last one, the sparrow, for this bed. Who killed Cock Robin? The sparrow, they said. He wants them all dead. To him, honey sweet is their sobbing. So that's the laughing sweet blood on his lips. They call him a killer straight out can be inferred but it's not as direct as the other two where you're taking that word straight from the poem on the bed to the main poem but even if you are only looking for that pattern you'll get at least two of the four numbers correct and you can kind of brute force the other two by guessing um so like this one doesn't bother me nearly as much as the keypad face nonsense puzzle or Shakespeare which just requires so much knowledge of things outside of the game in order to solve We can all agree Shakespeare is BS. As said, there's like an interview. There's a thing with uh, Jeremy Blaustein. Was it, or was it a tweet? It might have been a, a tweet in response to, to some other things where he said he apologizes for the Shakespeare puzzle. And when the localizer apologizes for, for that puzzle, I think that really says everything about it. Damn it, I hate slurpers so fucking much. Why are you like this? No, don't reload. If this was extreme 10, that moves an insta kill. Blasting do the first three? No, he did two, three, and four. Whoever was here before is gone. So is that smoky stuff. What was that anyway? Nothing good. Cremated key, burned black but still usable, plastic bag, totally ordinary, transparent plastic bag, this is from a trash can in the locker room, let's go get some blood. So 
story playthrough on Extreme 10. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Like, I'm fine with doing some Extreme 10 runs once we start getting stuff unlocked again. But... Story playthrough is definitely not gonna happen. It's, it's so hard to, like, do anything on Extreme 10, let alone stop and talk about stuff. I just want to talk about how talented Heather is for a moment for this. So we've got this, this bucket that is absolutely filled, like completely to the brim with blood, as well as just like a regular Ziploc bag. No problem. I put the blood in the plastic bag. Got a plastic bag with blood. It didn't like spill everywhere. It's not all over her. That blood that's on her vest was there already. Can we get a lore playthrough of DBD? I know you're trying to be you're trying to be cute about that, but I've done that. We've gone through like and read all the character lore and watched all the animatics that you unlock through the archives and all that stuff. Yep. Been there, done that. Although I, I need to still go over the newer lore, the stuff from the K-pop chapter, and the newer things from this rift and the last rift. Lore playthrough of Death Stranding? Maybe. Maybe soon. Um, my first playthrough is archived, which is like 130 hours and very thorough. Maxing out all connections and piecing together the story. But now that I know what the story is, I could explain things as I'm playing through it a lot better. So I could do like a more proper in-depth of Death Stranding. Um, I love that game. I'd be absolutely fine doing that at some point. Should I play Death Stranding? Are you pretty patient with quote-unquote walking simulator type games? Where a lot of times you're just going from point A to point B. Like, the whole point of the game is kind of how long it takes to do things. It's a big part of it. Everyone hates on that game? Uh, it's just, it's a very different concept for a game, and you got to be really, really patient with it. Like, it, if you're the type of person who just, like, if you're like, oh god, I just want to get to the next cutscene, you probably will not like that game. Um, if you can just sit and enjoy the game for what it is and all of its little weird story stuff that happens and a lot of just walking around looking at beautiful landscapes avoiding bts uh and just kind of enjoying taking your time yeah building infrastructure and stuff as you go along and helping out other people online without ever actually really co-oping stuff like you don't have a whole lot of control over it. It's just, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of hurdles to get over for, for people uh, who play a lot of Kojima games. Like if you're used to the level of action and stuff that's in like Metal Gear and things like that, you'll, you'll be disappointed with most of Death Stranding if you're looking for, you know, that, that type of pacing, because it is, it is meant to be a very slow pace, take your time, enjoy the world, and also sometimes there's story happening. And I think the story bits and stuff are great, but... You really gotta be able to enjoy, like, the simple stuff in between. 
of I've got deliveries to take, what's the best way to route them out, um, you know, get everything done quickly and efficiently without damaging things, and, you know, yeah, enjoy the landscape and, I don't know, it's just, it's a very slow game, but I enjoyed the fuck out of it. But if you don't consider yourself, like, a pretty patient type of person, then, uh, yeah, you're probably going to have a real rough time with it. Just hate the motorcycle. Give me an ATV for that kind of environment. I mean, you can build roads and drive a truck and eventually just build zip lines and not deal with being on the ground at all. It all depends on how much time you want to sink into it. Because you've got to do a lot of infrastructure building, but once you have it, there you go. I probably spent like 50, 60 hours building zip lines, building roads, gathering the materials for that. Uh, yeah. Real shame you can't even listen to all that music while, oh, excuse me, while on the road. Most of the songs are really good. See, I'm one of the people that is fine with like not having a music player and not having things like that. Just taking in the environmental sounds for the most part of the game so that when story is happening and when the low roar songs and stuff like that kick in, it's more impactful. It's, it's during parts of the game where it feels more appropriate rather than just random times when you're tumbling down the side of a mountain trying to pick up a box of sperm. That's literally one of the things you deliver in that game. It's like sperm and eggs from place to place. So, yeah, it doesn't feel quite the same when you've got fucking serious low roar stuff playing outside of when it would normally play or any other music player stuff that would be going on. I feel like the music is, is well used for the times where it's used, but otherwise when you're just kind of out in the world... I like that you're just out in the world. Uh, you're just kind of there with Sam in the middle of nowhere listening to the world around you. All right. I'm going to try to be really careful and not skip this text. I literally let go of all controls... And that was the most gentle spacebar press of my fucking life. And did you see that? Like, I talk about how sensitive this game is with skipping text, and it's only one time that you get it. Well, I... That's number two. That's number two. I made a promise at the start of the stream. That, uh... When that happens, I'm gifting subs. So that's another sub. Let's see who gets it. Some die young seven. Some die young. Enjoy the sub. Enjoy the emotes, courtesy of my fucking stupidity. Like, I literally said it out loud. Like, look at me trying to be careful and not skip this text. What happens? Or room. Where was my... 
quick save at. Got the cremated key, need the blood. And I'm on this floor, okay. Hey, Goji Monster, welcome back. Thank you so much for the five months. Appreciate that, Risa. Thank you, thank you. If, if it's truly is simply a hard thing to pull off. I mean, the amount of experience I have with this game, I don't really have an excuse. I, I know about all of its weird shit and all those things, and I still manage to, like, not do that right. So what we're gonna do is come in here, quick save, and we'll do this until I fucking get it. Oh, second try. I saw that drawn on the dividing screens at the hospital. But this is different. Seems like it was drawn a long time ago. Somehow. Title is Lost Memories. Bit of an on the nose reference there. Heather literally has lost her memories. She's regaining her memories slowly as the, the game goes on. But uh, she's trying to remember all of these things from her past that are memories from her past lives, memories of her life as Cheryl and as Alessa. One characteristic mentioned only in rare documents and dying out in the modern age is that of the ritual sacrifice. Offering prayers, pierce a man's chest with a copper stake, drench the altar in the blood which spouts red from the heart, to praise and to show loyalty unto God. Oh, shit. Sorry. I'm wearing down. We're getting there, though. We're nearing uh, kind of the end. In another sacrificial rite mentioned in the same book, the victim is burned alive. This was a more dignified ceremony in which prisoners and sinners were not allowed to participate. Only the clergy could be sacrificed. Similar to burning at the stake, no comparable rite can be found in religions practiced nearby. It may have some connection with the main deity being a sun god. Even though this religion extols... money that you view with such scorn. power of money that you view with such scorn fire lord vaughn thank you for the five thanks for the long stream now but appreciate the effort you put into these in-depth playthroughs they are a joy to watch hey thank you for keeping me company and helping me get through all of this like go through these long streams and give me qu good questions and good conversations and just chilling hanging out Seriously, it means a lot to me that I can do this and ramble on about my favorite games for hours and hours and hours on end and, and people still want to hang out and listen and, and talk about them. Seriously, it, there's nothing else like it. I, it means so much to me. So thank you so much for the support and just for being here. The power of money that you view with such scorn. 
More like machines with another five. Wake the fuck up, samurai. It's tea time. <laughs> it is. It is pretty much uh, almost tea time. Um, but we're we're uh, literally at the very end of Brookhaven. I'm going to finish up Brookhaven and then uh, take a short break so that I can grab some tea, get a little more caffeine going, go and stretch and wake up a little bit for the, the last home stretch of the game that's left after this. Thank you so much, More Like Machines. Seriously, that is super, super f kind of you. Armor Abs Crabs with the brand new sub. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate the new sub. Hope you're enjoying the stream. Thank you so much for the support. Enjoy the emotes. Some heather booties. Some quick nuts. A lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> Thank you. If tips counted towards hype rain, uh, hype rain, hype train, we'd be close. I have a uh, hype train turned off. I don't have, I don't have fun things enabled on my channel. No channel points, no hype trains. Uh, we're very serious business about Silent Hill, Silent Hill lore here. No fun allowed. It's it's basically a college course on on Silent Hill. And if I catch you playing around with your phones, I'm going to take them up and not give them back until the end of the year. Even though this religion extols redemption, it brings to mind a dark and cultish history. Yeah, I like this guy. I like this artist representation of Zuchilbara. Just like that body and just the long red smear going all the way up the cloth. Put the blood from the treatment room in this. I don't especially want to carry it around with me. Well, we've carried it long enough. Do we get a certification? Only if you pass. Only if you pass. Question number one on the test. From Silent Hill 2, which we covered last week. There's an Easter egg that has to be translated from the three coins found in the apartments. What is the name of the boy who was born in December of last year in that Easter egg? at everybody flunk in the class. Hey, Haunter. Tatsuki. Tatsuki ga kyone no jinigatsu ni umaremashita. Given how long that took, if anyone was asleep, you get a pass. <laughs> That's fair, I guess. All right, let's go take care of Leonard.
together. Yeah? Leonard, where are you? Thank you. Now I can finally leave here. Now Claudia's ridiculous dream is over. Well, I guess it's time to dispose of her. The salvation of all mankind. Ha! <laughs> Why must we reward even the unbelievers? What are you talking about? About our plans, of course. It's true that God is merciful. But first, one must be chosen. Only we, who hearken to the voice of God, will be given the keys to paradise. Don't you think so, Peter? What do you mean by that? I mean that I don't think the way you guys do. I don't want any part of that kind of paradise. You're an unbeliever. You deceived me. I didn't deceive you. We were both just wrong about each other. I thought you were a normal person. So, you tried to trick me so you can run off with my seal, eh? Heretic! You plan to destroy God! I told you I wasn't trying to trick anyone. What is this seal thing anyway? Don't play innocent. You can't fool me anymore. The seal is mine! I was appointed by God to be its guardian! Some dead. Leonard, is that you? Death to all who turn their backs on God. Is every person here a mental case? Well, I guess you're not a person anyway. Look at that smug look she gets <laughs> when she says that. She's so proud of herself. Shotgun ammo. That should be all my SMG. Oh, not quite. There we go. Leonard's not here anymore. I guess I should head back to the motel now. I hope Douglas is okay. Huh? 
What's this? Got a talisman. Actually, the seal of Metatron, the seal that Leonard was protecting. Has an odd design inscribed on it. Got it after I defeated Leonard. Uh, catch up on chat a little here. Wemsters was asking, who's Leonard's uh, voice actor? Uh, Mike Lagon? Matt Lagon. Is it Matt Lagon? Let me double check. Matt Lagon. Uh, who does a bunch of acting and stuff in recent years. Uh, he's in like the Sharktopus and Mecha Piranha and like all those kind of crappy <laughs> like movies. Uh, he does a lot of that stuff now. Is there, uh, Jackalopes, is there any relevance with Leonard's appearance? So, not as far as I can tell, like, there's so many theories behind why Leonard looks the way that he does, um, and to also go into, I'll get you for this is comments, is he a normal guy, but Heather sees him as a monster? I, I don't think so, um... This game doesn't really do the Silent Hill 2 thing of everyone's perceptions of reality being so skewed. Like, seeing everything as a player, like, through Heather's eyes, you're pretty much seeing things as they are. It's reality changing. Like, so he's either real and looks like that just because he's been in the other world, like, trapped in the other world for so long. Um,. He could possibly have been affected by Claudia, since Claudia is known to have powers as well. He could be a manifestation of the town, and some people theorize that he he was already dead. We talked about Vincent's They Look Like Monsters thing. Like, he's literally referencing Silent Hill 2 and how things are different, and he follows it up immediately with saying that it's just a joke he's literally making a reference and fucking with Heather and via Heather fucking with you as a player um but yeah it uh it's nothing like that this is Silent Hill 1 rules it's a continuation of Silent Hill 1 the power is working very much like that the nightmare spreads out over onto reality. Anybody in the influence of that reality sees the, the manifestations. You don't see your own personal thing. You don't have one person seeing a person and one person seeing a monster and that kind of thing the way they do in 2. That's a very unique thing that they did for Silent Hill 2. And the other games are, are very much not like that. Um, so, yeah. It's just something that I feel like a lot of fans apply to the rest of the series, even though it is a very unique concept for Silent Hill 2. I guess they kind of try to copy it for the Western games and stuff like that. But yeah, in Silent Hill 1, Silent Hill 3, reality changes. You know, Heather, Douglas, they're seeing the same nightmare. They're seeing the same things. They're not seeing their own individual versions of Silent Hill or manifestations around them. Reality is a constant, even if it's being affected by the other world. It's still reality, and anybody who's in it sees it that way. Silent Hill 2 was just like so much about the individual's character being so broken, James so blinded by his delusion, all of those elements making them see their own individual things. There was also no real focal point for like the power in Silent Hill 2. There was no 
Alessa, there was no Heather, uh, there was no single source where the nightmare was spreading from. It was just sort of drawing from whoever's there. Which, for James, he saw his stuff. Angela saw hers. Eddie saw his. Laura saw basically nothing. But yeah, that's unique to two. Did you send her to my father? Was that wrong? It's your fault that he... Oh, but surely it's a good thing. Uh, it means he was one of God's beloved, no? Those who mock God will never receive salvation. You'll go to hell, Vincent. You'll never feel the joy of God's everlasting paradise. And you think God is going to save you? Ha! Huh. What do you know anyway? I know about the pleasures of this world. And I want to find my happiness while I'm still here. You hated your father, didn't you? I saw the way he hit you, he kicked you, he made you cry. The memory of his cruelty is forever burned into my mind. Yes, yes, and that's why we need God. What you call faith? is nothing more than a child crying out for love. That's why you're all alone. You don't understand. None of you do. So there we get our sort of conclusion with Claudia. And... Leonard she sounds upset for for all of this arguing when you first talk to Leonard on the phone and how he's ready to start yelling at Claudia and how they've seemed to have been butting heads for a long time about their beliefs and everything like that they still had some part of themselves that cared about the other Leonard still kind of shows remorse when you talk to him on the phone and he's like if she was willing to change her ways you know things could have been different Claudia's upset that Vincent sent Heather this way counting on the fact that she would find Leonard and kill him and get the seal of Metatron he's counting on her to have that Vincent is actively trying to stop Claudia And he knows that the seal of Metatron could potentially be used to do that. The only problem is, just like everything else that the town's power sort of affects, if you believe in something, if it's in your mind and you believe in it, the town can manifest it and make it real. So if you are a fervent believer of the, the cult's faith and you believe in the seal of Metatron and what it can do, it's a very powerful artifact. If you're Heather, who has this experience of being Alessa, Cheryl, and herself, who does not follow the cult's faith, she's got some psychic abilities, but ultimately the Seal of Metatron doesn't really do anything for her. Not the way that it would if full-on Alessa herself had it, or if Leonard had it. So... Be a 
avoiding one particular name. I'm tired and doing my best to keep up with this stuff and still explain it after doing these sort of playthroughs for like years. So, I mean, I'm not avoiding anything. I just have a normal human brain that's trying to keep up with a lot of lore over the years. So if you have questions, don't be... Don't be shy. I'm not avoiding anything. A lot of stuff is just harder to explain than others. A lot of things can't be explained. This is not a spoiler-free Vulgan. You don't have to be coy. Just say who you mean. Vincent. Every time you mention the seal of Metatron and the belief is power system, you don't mention one person in the game. I'm sure I'll bring it up for later. Vincent. Vincent doesn't believe in it either. He makes money through the cult. He's kind of this game's parallel to Kaufman. He knows about their beliefs. He makes money through it. Uh, the power of money that you view with such scorn. My tip uh, alert. So he has his own set of beliefs. He believes in the almighty dollar. So he thinks that, you know, Heather, she used to be Alessa. She'll be able to use the seal. So it must do some good for her to have it. He doesn't count on the fact that Heather is her own unique person. Even though she shares a soul with Alessa, she's not Alessa. That belief is not there. Maybe it was in a past life, but not for Heather. And Claudia calls that shit out right away. Says, it's just a piece of junk. What do you plan to do with that? Uh, but yeah, before I continue on, I definitely need to, uh, go and get some more tea, try and get a little more caffeine going, get up and stretch, kind of wake myself up a little bit. We're kind of, like I said, getting to the home stretch here. This went on, is still continuing to go on much longer than I had anticipated, and I still need to, like, sleep and take care of stuff today, and then be back tonight and try and do some Silent Hill 4, so... Whew. Busy week. Busy, busy week ahead. Not a lot of sleeping. But yeah, I will, uh... Be back in a few minutes, and we will continue on with some more Silent Hill 3. This will probably be the last break, and we should be coming up on finishing the game in the next uh, two hours, maybe. Put us right at that 16, maybe almost 17 hour mark. yeah thanks you guys for watching so far and uh yeah let me wake up a little bit get something to drink stretch and uh i'll be back in a couple minutes and we'll keep going
We're back from outer space. Although no UFO ending this time around. Next time we'll do a we'll do a whole separate couple of weeks, and I'll go back through the whole series again and do UFO and joke endings, and kind of focus on some other New Game Plus type stuff. We just finished up Brookhaven. We had a cutscene there with Claudia upset with Vincent that he directed Heather towards Leonard hoping for Heather to kill Leonard which she did get the seal of Metatron which she did and you'll notice that cutscene where Claudia and Vincent are talking to each other is in Heather's hotel room they're in the room that Heather and Douglas were in. So now as we head back to that room, Claudia has already left and is preparing for our next encounter. Vincent stayed behind. He's going to give us some somewhat useful information. this but music track he left a message for you was there someone else here just now no no just me don't you want to know what the message is yeah what did he say the church is on the other side of the lake church i wonder what he meant by that you don't understand? That's where Claudia is. Across the lake. On the north side. If you're going, you better go through the amusement park. It's probably the only way in now. Go northwest on Nathan Avenue. It's a bit far. But closer than heaven. That it for the message? Uh huh. Thanks. Douglas really said that? What's wrong? You don't trust me? The super low guitar strums are badass. Yeah, they're like really kind of buried there in the mix, but those little like Bannet. In it. Yeah, underrated track for sure. Legendary Lunatic. 51 months of love and support. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Hope you're doing well. Oh, what is it, Harry? My cat is reaching up and grabbing my arm. He's like, stop, stop. Just go to bed. He's worried about me. I know. We're staying up and talking to the computer a lot.
I love that. It's one of my favorite line deliveries from Heather in this whole game. That is that is the appropriate response right there. After everything she's been through and everything that's led to this moment and then now she's here exactly where she was at the very beginning of the game having that nightmare in the diner and now we're here at Lakeside Amusement Park and as soon as she recognizes that that's where this is the same place from her nightmare that Ah oh, hell. <laughs> I love it. Giant rabbit costume. Isn't this the mascot from the local amusement park? I don't want to look inside. Something in there smells terrible. The stuffed animal rabbit. Isn't this the mascot from the local amusement park? The whole smells terrible part. Once you read it, it's gone. There's a dead body inside this box thing. There's nothing interesting here. There's nothing I can do about it. But I wonder who and why someone did this. Here where you can read one of Harry's notes on the ticket cab. It's in the, um, the magic ice cream shop magic ice cream booth um, but yeah we're coming up on one of the notes that we can read one of the the save points from Silent Hill 1 Everything fell, and she'll even point out that there's differences between her nightmare and now. The sweets seem to have fallen from the shelf and gotten crushed. This wasn't part of my dream. Got the roller coaster key. Another view at some of the mascots. I love this artwork. Look at this artwork of Robbie, where he has. Ah, fuck you. Oh my god. I just want to show things. And there's these fucking pendulums. But the, like, simplistic Robbie art with like the really small eyes. This must be some gadget to control a roller coaster. I don't know how to make it work though. There's a power switch on the left hand side. Been left on. Turn it off. Oh my god, pendulums. Please shut up. Ah, the sweet release. Will there ever be a Silent Hill 3 hack stream like Silent Hill 2? Such a fun stream. Neko Run was uh, here earlier. So, um, yeah, maybe. Maybe at some point. I'll, uh, I'll talk to Neko and uh, see if they would be interested in joining me for, for that. Because I'd love to go through the rest of the games and do, like, different hacking things and more cam hack 
explore the game and all that stuff. There was so much cool stuff we discovered when we did that for Silent Hill 2. So many things I would not have expected. Lots of little details and places that you just can't see and were never meant to see, but there's still details there anyway. Yeah, the big stairway actually being one large stairway, not just uh, a, a loop. I hired you to find the girl, and you performed serviceably. What is it now? You lied to me about Heather, lady. I don't like being used. Lie? What lie? That Heather was kidnapped. But it's true. She was originally one of us. That man, Harry Mason, stole her away and kept her hidden from us. Yeah, but she says she was happy. She was brainwashed by him. Deceived, because her true self had not yet awoken. She carries God within her. But when Alessa, mother of God, truly awakens, yeah? What's gonna happen? She will usher in the eternal paradise. <laughs> what kind of place is that? A place with no pain, no hunger, no sickness, no old age. There will be no greed or war, and all will live by God's grace alone. No this, no that, no nothing. A paradise? For castrated sheep, maybe. Sounds pretty boring. I pity you. You still don't understand. You're going to kill me? Is it really so easy for you? I've done it before. Then I truly do pity you. Claudia then proceeds to Matrix Bend around the bullets and kick the shit out of Douglas. He was not expecting that. Would have loved to have seen that. So would I. Because when we go see Douglas again, his, like, arms broke, legs broke, beat to shit. Like, what happened? <laughs> I want to see that, that confrontation. Hey, what's up, Tato? Hope you're doing well today. The Borley Haunted Mansion. Easy to miss little sign here. If you have a weak heart or maybe pregnant. Please refrain from entering. Any children under the age of eight must be accompanied by an adult. Just your typical warning on a ride. Nothing to worry about, I guess. Except that she is pregnant with a crazy cult god. And if we're going by original Cheryl's age, she can't go in there without an adult.
We're so glad you came. Please come inside and look around. When you feel you're ready, then go through the door. Uh, hang on. I'm not ready to go through the door yet. One second. Okay. Sorry about that. There was tacos in my living room. And I had to go and get me one of them tacos. A family of four was sliced into bloody pieces in this room. Ah, oh, the cries of the children. The murderer was caught. Do you know why he said he killed his family? Because I felt I had to! Anyway, I'm lying. It's all just a joke. I wanted to scare you, that's all. The truth is, only one person died. By suicide. Hold on. Not exactly going to be subtle with the setup on this one. Hmm. Which one? Door creaking? Oh, that's not a door.
no audio. Fuck. Why is it all breaking? Oh, that's why.
like the people who are complaining about broken immersion. I'm sorry. I've been streaming for the last 15 hours. I was awake for like seven hours before that. I'm at that point where I'm very tired and losing my mind. It's a long running tradition on this channel to go through and, and twerk. Oh, my mic. It's a long, long running tradition to, to do some twerking when we get to the Borley Haunted Mansion. Am I for real? Look at the uptime. Look at the uptime for the channel. I've been doing this for 15 hours. And uh, we're not done. That's just, that's how I roll. That's how I do these streams. I stay up way too late. I try and be as good as I can for as long as I can talking about the uh, the lore and everything in great depth. Was the twerking worth my sleep? It's 15 hours of, 14 hours and 50 minutes of dedicated going through and talking about lore and I spent 10 minutes twerking. But yeah, that's the part that ruined my sleep. Oh, this is where we get info about the mascots. All the other mascots other than Robbie that nobody knows about. It's about Don the Duck, one of the park's mascots. But that's a lot of information I really don't read right now. Don't need right now. Don't read night now. Oh my god, my brain has turned into pudding. It's about Kathy the Kitty, one of the park's mascots. Heather, I need that information. I need all of that information right now. Please just read it. I need to know about Kathy. It's about Huey the horse. One of the park's mascots. Give me that chain. We're going to need that for later. The flyer for some kind of musical for kids. Looks like they did it on this stage. This place is empty now, but I'll bet it was packed that day. concerned? No, because most of them are regulars. They're they're not new to the channel. Big end. They know I've been streaming and doing long streams since uh, 2015. This is this is just how I stream when I play Silent Hill. I used to do 24 hour marathons like every week or two. So this is actually toned way down from how I used to. Oh no, my sleep schedule's absolutely fucked. That goes, that should go without saying. 
but it's all right. There you go. Look at Douglas. Claudia kicked his Come fucking on. ass. How powerful could a god from a dump like this be? I'm sure it'll be no big deal. Yeah, but anyway, something's gonna happen. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'd all be better off if it did. But if this is how I got a mercy axe, I don't want to see any more of him. That's a pretty good reason to risk my life, don't you think? Plus, I'm just an old fool, right? You think you're Superman or something? You know, I always wanted to be him. Besides, yeah. I want to help you out. You don't have to feel responsible. I know it's not your fault. You, you remind me of my son. You said nobody was going to cry for you. Dead people don't cry. Stupid kid got himself shot robbing his bank. was a penniless good for nothing. Who knows? Anyway, now I guess I'll never find out. <sighs> Sorry. I shouldn't have said you reminded me of a guy like that. <laughs> well, maybe if you had compared me to your daughter. <laughs> Listen. I'll take care of the rest. You stay here and I'll be back when it's over. You'll be okay by yourself. Hey, no problem. <sighs> Besides, my dad's not around anymore. So only I can do this. So, we already know that Heather would essentially just reincarnate eventually. But Douglas does <clears throat> kind of have a point. It would at least delay things for another 17, 18 years. Extra 
your dialogue talking to him again. What is it? I just came by to make sure you were still alive. Sorry. I'd come with you if I wasn't hurt. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the problem with older guys, huh? I'll handle things. You just rest. Yeah, Techie, they do. This is the homecoming church music. I've listened to this on loop, trying to learn clips. Wait, what does Douglas have a point about? That shooting Heather at this point might be the only way to stop all this nightmare. And the thing is, there's a lot of story that you missed out on, Biggin. About 14 hours, almost 15 hours of going through and competently explaining things before my mind turned into pudding and leaked out of my ears and we had a dance party. Um, but before that, I was doing pretty good <laughs> at keeping up and explaining the story. But essentially, our main character, Heather, has a, has a demon growing inside of her, a god. And it's about to be born relatively soon and it's the source of all of this evil stuff that's going on and if Douglas shoots Heather she might actually just die and this will just end you're boring bro and you don't know anything anyway yeah well what are you doing with your life Leap that wall if you're so great. <laughs> Gotta head out and be responsible. Thanks again for the stream nub. Rest well after this. Oh, I'm gonna crash super hard after this. Take it easy, Ducky. Have a good one. Thank you for hanging out. We got a doll's head. This symbol usually looks unnatural and weird, but here it sort of seems to fit. Still makes me feel creepy though, like someone peeking into my brain. So we get a Oh, I've got a face, and I've got a beard on that face. But only the subscribers can see the cam. Client Claudia Wolf. Request searching for then infant Alessa Gillespie. Kidnapped by man named Harry Mason. No word from police. Kidnap location unknown. Old Silent Hill newspaper article. Alessa Gillespie, age 7, dead in fire. Links to current case. To be investigated. Priority low. Using alias Heather. Neighbors do not know real name. What is she hiding? So... For some reason, it doesn't give you all of Douglas's memo information when you read it on the chair when you pick it up. It just gives you the first few pages. And then if you read it from the menu, you get some more pages. According to records, 24 years old. Client says, look 17. Plausible? We talked about that earlier. Uh, the age discrepancy. It's adding the age that... Cheryl died, or reunited with Alessa, or it could be the age when Alessa's soul was split, both of which were at the age of seven. 
plus Heather's current age of 17. Or 24 years old. But, yeah. In this current life uh, as Heather, she's basically been around for 17 years. Even though her soul is older. Lived in Portland till 12 years ago. Got wrapped up in a murder case. Harry shot suspect. Justifiable self-defense, so no punishment. Moved away immediately after, started to use alias. So the cult started looking for and found Heather. And the first time they came around, Harry fucking smoked them. He shot and killed somebody. And then they moved away. And then started using the alias, trying to hide more. Apparently no connection with the criminal, just some occult freak, slightly off from way back. Originally from Silent Hill. And we got this a lot earlier. This is back when Douglas first drove Heather to Silent Hill after the Harry Mason death scene. And it's Harry Mason's notebook, Dad's notebook. Dad wrote about my past in here. As always, this should be novelized. So we get a lot of insight from Harry's perspective on things that happened back during the original game. Oh, excuse me. And kind of the events leading up to this game. I hope this will never come to any use. Maybe it's better if you never know. More than anything else, I fear the possibility of your going away far from me. But sometimes we have to tell the truth. That's why I'm writing this, before I'm lost in death and oblivion. What happened back then? That has something to do with who you are. It all started 24 years ago. Coming back from a vacation, my wife and I found a baby on the side of the highway. Since we were childless, we thanked God for letting us meet this child, this girl. We took her home. Three years later, my wife died. And another four years later, 17 years ago, I came to Silent Hill. I heard the girl's pleas and took her with me, not knowing why she wanted us to go there. And it was there that the young girl went away. Not that she actually went anywhere, nor did she die. Returned to her original self. That's what Dahlia Gillespie said. Original self. That was the young woman, burned by her mother as a sacrifice to God. Alessa Gillespie. Half her soul escaped in those flames and went on to live in a baby, in that girl of mine, of ours. Seven years passed before that half a girl returned to Silent Hill and made Alessa whole again. Newly strengthened, she vowed to kill God. God, a fetus nestled into this sacrificial girl's womb, was summoned with the usual rites. This was Alessa's wish, no matter what the outcome, even if her own existence were at stake. But that wish was not granted. My interruption meant she prayed instead for the girl's return. I alone couldn't bring her back. Dahlia did it. I only helped at the birthing ceremony to bring God out of Alessa. Mmm, that was Kaufman, but whatever. You know, who's counting? The newly born God wailed once and was dead. All from that girl's, and probably Alessa's, conscious resistance. That's not the end. 
After God had vanished in a glow of light, Alessa reappeared and gave me a baby. She looked a lot like that girl so long ago. And then Alessa was gone. Dead. There was nothing I could have done to help. I simply clutched the baby to my chest and ran off. The whole thing felt like a dream. But I had proof that it wasn't. The girl was nowhere to be found, and in my arms, the baby. Now, seventeen years have passed. It feels like only yesterday. And again, it feels like a million years ago. I confess, I had reservations at first about raising that baby. Could I love her? Her existence was thoroughly unexplainable. I thought she could be that young woman who snatched away my beloved daughter. That led to sadness, anger. There were times where I put my hands around her tiny little throat. Several times I even considered abandoning her. That's what a terrible person I am. But I decided to raise her after all. I just couldn't seem to let her go. When she... When you... Look at me. You laugh so... Even now I can't forget about that girl. But I love you. I have no doubts about that. That's all I ask you to believe. To my precious daughter, Harry Mason. Easy puzzle here. We picked up a shoe. We picked up a doll head. Oh. Just goes into each mannequin. Some uh, fairy tale references here Snow White, Seven Dwarfs, and Cinderella. Some of Alessa's favorite uh, fairy tales. They're used for themes, for puzzles and things in Silent Hill 1. Uh, Nub, at the time Silent Hill 1 was written, do you think the woman in white who hands the baby to Harry at the end was meant to be Alessa or the god? Do you think the good endings were supposed to be happy in that regard? Absolutely. That's they they go out of their way to even name those characters like separately. Um the god is referred to as the Incubus and Alessa with her soul reunited is referred to as the Incubator. So it's it's not the god. The thing that comes out of Alessa and good good plus is the god itself. Alessa is the incubator. She's just the vessel for God to be born. This is the dragon that guards the treasure chests. It's just a prop. Not scary at all.
All right. Things are dead. The banging noise has stopped. We can uh, now kind of take a look at where we're at. This is one of the few familiar parts of Lakeside Amusement Park. It's Magic Ice Cream House. From Silent Hill 1. And it's one of the few instances where we've got a save point from Silent Hill 1. So the red and blue notepad is your save point throughout the first game. And in the first game, Harry Mason, he's a writer by profession. And whenever he comes across the save points, the notepads, he's essentially just writing down what all of his experiences up to that point were. But you never get to read what he's writing down. It just, in Silent Hill 1, it just functions like a save point. So now, finally, in Silent Hill 3, we get to read what he wrote on some of these save points, some of these notepads. Dahlia's the one who said it. Said that girl was a demon. That she took my daughter for a sacrifice. But it's not totally believable. I mean, appearances can be deceiving. When I saw that photo in the hospital basement, I thought, that girl looks like Cheryl. Is that why I feel this way? Something's not normal anyway. Nothing good will come of this. But I just can't think of her as a demon. Is it my imagination? Or do I actually feel sorry for her? Why do I feel like she's looking for someone to help? Cheryl's what's important to me. Everything else can wait until I've gotten her back. There's a date and a signature at the end. It's dated some 17 years earlier and signed by Harry. Dad? Dad? Signed by Harry Dad. Is there an ending where you give birth to God and world ends? Yes. It's technically a game over, but it's also kind of an ending. Do it? Okay. When we get to that point, I will do it. So I guess this kind of counts as a puzzle. There's a note on one of the horses that basically says when the when the merry-go-round makes so many rotations, you'll be out of time. In fact, let's just read it. Let's read it before I get them all. Who made this song? Akira Yamaoka. He did all the music for this game. This horse isn't moving. There's a nail stuck deep in its head. Yeah, read the note, not the nail. Um... I gotta turn this down just a little bit here. When 13 turns count four, you will die from their curse. If you wish to escape, there is but one way out. To kill before you are killed. You will be saved by the 12th death. So, 
kill before you're killed. If you don't do anything and this manages to rotate enough times, it takes a long time for it to actually happen. But if you let it just go without killing the horses, you will eventually die. So the horses are spraying out this like orange mist from their mouths. Eventually, the whole merry-go-round just fills up with that orange mist. But it, it takes, like, literally 10-plus minutes of just standing around waiting for this to go enough times before it happens. Where did they get that absurdly large piece of paper? Does Silent Hill have an office supply store? I mean, it's got a stationery store. And bookstores that would probably have, like, things... Things like that. Rotations while you're reading the letter count? Can you die mid-read? Technically, yes. But again, it's it's so unlikely. You have to wait for so much time to pass. So now it's time for Heather to confront herself, or at least who she used to be, what's left of her. Alessa's shrieking insanity, as Masahiro Ito phrased it. Well, all that's left of Alessa is a memory. And that memory is insane now. Shattered Memories, y'all remember that game? Oh, we we remember all the Silent Hill games here. Necromatico. I'll be playing Shattered Memories on Thursday night. I blocked too early.
Fire versus Sybil flashbacks. That's exactly what they're going for. This game, as said, it's constantly par like parallel to Silent Hill 1. Vincent is like the parallel to Kaufman. Claudia is the parallel to Dahlia. Uh, Heather, of course, is the parallel to Harry. This whole setup is supposed to be parallel to the merry-go-round fight against Sybil, which happens right before you go to what's called Nowhere at the end of Silent Hill 1. And we're about to get to the Nowhere equivalent. Yeah, Douglas is sort of your parallel to Sybil. Former law enforcement, now a private investigator. But still kind of plays that role. It would be better for myself to die. After all, it's nothing to be afraid of. That child... That demon, when I think of the endless pain it will bring when it is birthed, I decided that instead of the suffering and cruelty I endured in that sick room, that I would like to bestow a more gentle and peaceful death on myself. Why do I resist? I never thought of myself as such a fool. Lessa's sort of final words, final thoughts. She wants... She wants to bestow a more peaceful death on Heather. He figures it's better than all the torture that she went through, lying in that hospital bed, suffering and growing the god, and just not being able to really do anything about it. So Alessa kind of has the same plan here compared to Douglas. Douglas was ready to just like, you know, maybe if I shoot you, this will all end. Alessa's also at a point where she's like, if you just die, like, you might reincarnate, but at the same time, the god will be delayed from being born. Alessa, I guess it's kind of strange for me to call you that since you are me. But you know what? You and I don't think alike after all. And it's not that I don't remember that sick room either. So now that Heather has confronted this part of herself, this memory of Alessa, and sort of overtaken it, she's taken control of her, her will. She is her own person. She might be a reincarnation. It might be Alessa's soul. But she's still Heather. She's still herself. But at this point, she has all the memories. Nothing is uh, repressed anymore at this point. She remembers her life as Alessa. She remembers being in that sick room. She remembers her life as uh, Cheryl. And the time spent with Harry the first time around before being reincarnated into Cheryl 2. <laughs> like she is now. Stained by the evils of this world, we hold our sorrows within us. Only you can heal us these wounds. Each morning, afternoon, evening, and night, we call out your name and pray for the day of the miraculous descent. Some insight into the cult's belief. Their, their beliefs have really changed a lot over the course of hundreds of years, but especially in the 17 years since Silent Hill 1's events. Um, the cult has really branched off. They've started, uh, a lot of their beliefs have changed. We saw a little bit of that with the interaction between Leonard and Claudia. They're members of the same faith, but they have very different beliefs, uh, of what is the goal of their faith and of their, their cult essentially. So all this text kind of starts building up where Claudia is, sort of her branch of the faith, which has been referred to as the Descent of the Holy Mother. The belief that Saint Alessa will return 
and birth the god as was always planned and that the god will cleanse the world with fire basically purge all humanity I miss Douglas's journal what's your explanation for the entry saying Heather is 24 in Douglas's journal I, I literally explained it earlier Empress and like five minutes ago which you could just like not five minutes ago but like right before when I got to this but it's it's literally the discrepancy of the first Cheryl. There's Alessa, there's Cheryl, and there's Cheryl too, a.k.a. Heather. If you count the seven years that the first Cheryl was alive and then reunited and reincarnated into Cheryl too, Heather, you add the seven years that Cheryl was alive the soul split to the 17 years that Heather's been alive. 24. It's in Douglas's notebook, and it's a discrepancy because of the information from the cult. According to records, 24 years old. Client says, looks 17. So, records, he's looking at, are only going to list one Cheryl Mason. And that's the original Cheryl Mason. But she was reunited. She was half of Alessa's soul. She was reunited with Alessa. They, re they were reincarnated into the new Cheryl at the end of Silent Hill 1 in good or good plus ending. And then, they've been, and then she's been alive for 17 years. So 17 plus 7. And then in Harry's notebook... He explains it a bit more clearly. It all started 24 years ago. Coming back from a vacation, my wife and I found a baby on the side of the highway. That was the split soul. The first Cheryl. Since we were childless, we thanked God for letting us meet the child. Three years after the first Cheryl, Jody Mason dies. Four years later, when first Cheryl is seven years old, which is 17 years ago, he came to Silent Hill. That's the events of the first game. played Siren or Pathologic? I've played Siren. Uh, I have not played Pathologic. Siren games have a very similar mood to them. Uh, it was a few of the same people who worked on Silent Hill that worked on the Siren series. Um, Rick, um, what's his name? Hold on. One of the main people who worked on uh, Keichiro Toyama. So Keichiro Toyama, who uh, was one of the core members of Team Silent for Silent Hill 1, left Team Silent after the first game and uh, basically went and made Siren. Something written on the door. This door is the gate which leads to the road to paradise. Embrace the bosom of the Holy Mother. Admit your sins and be forgiven. Eternal tranquility can be yours. How did you get here? Vincent, wasn't it? He led you here. When will he cease his meddling? But it's just as well. Luring you here also serves my purposes. Checkmate. Not yet. The time is not yet at hand. 
the time when all will be forgiven their sins, when the paradise we have long dreamed for will arrive. After the judgment and atonement, an eternity of bliss. Oh, Alessa, the world you wanted is nearly here. That's not what I want. Not you. Alessa, your true self. But I am Alessa. My little Claudia, my dear, sweet sister. Alessa, is it you? Oh, how I've missed you. I don't need another world. It's fine the way it is. But you said it yourself. The world must first be cleansed with fire. But that's not what I want now. Alessa, don't you want happiness? Have you become blind to all the hopeless suffering in the world? We need, we all need God's salvation. Listen, suffering is a fact of life. Either you learn how to deal with that or you go under. You can stay in your own little dream world, but you can't keep hurting other people. Besides, I'll never forgive you for hurting my father. I wish only for the salvation of mankind. But for that to happen, the world must first be remade. And for that, we need God. You self-righteous witch! No one asked you to help! But I am Alessa. This is what's confusing. So first of all, it's A-L-E-S-S-A. -S -S -A, not Alyssa. Alessa. Second of all, what's confusing about it? She just overtook the memory of Alessa, got back all of her memories from her past lives, and she's able to put on a convincing, even though it's not very well acted, a convincing uh, imitation. He's pretending to be Alessa in order to fool Claudia and try to get her to just stop. She just wants Claudia to stop. She's just like, I don't need another world. I don't have to do this. It's me, Alessa. She's trying to bring this to an end without it necessarily being a violent confrontation. She just wants it to be over. Which honestly says a whole lot about Heather at this point, because she was so driven by revenge just to get up to this point, and now she still feels that quite a bit, but I feel like if Claudia would have been willing to, like, drop it right there, Heather probably would have let it go. Always love the I got the bad guy at gunpoint, but don't shoot them while they talk trope. Caught him monologuing. The fucking classic. I love that she also does the um, the action movie, the action movie quote, pointing the gun up. Checkmate. But she is Alessa. No, she's the third incarnation of Alessa's soul. She used to be Alessa, but she she's Heather, or Cheryl. Cheryl, too. But she remembers her life as Alessa at this point. But just because she's a reincarnation doesn't mean that she's exactly the same person. She's had her own life and experiences. She makes her own choices. She's still her own person.
He just has a shared soul. Some past lives. with the blind angel on the crystal window does it mean something yeah so i mean we're in like the cult's church at this point so these are all representations of the cult's beliefs represented in stained glass which we can actually read about right here on the sides of the room I'm trying to remember where this starts from this one? Yeah. One. Origin. In the beginning, people had nothing. So this is our, our sum up, our summary of cult beliefs up to this point. In the beginning, people had nothing. Their bodies ached, and their hearts held nothing but hatred. They fought endlessly, but death never came. They despaired, stuck in the eternal quagmire. Two, birth. Man offered a serpent to the sun and prayed for salvation. A woman offered a reed to the sun and asked for joy. Feeling pity for the sadness that had overrun the earth, God was born from those two people. So the serpent and the reed are kind of the cult's belief version of Adam and Eve. And if you'll look at the artwork. On the left, holding the serpent. On the right, holding the reed. Three, salvation. God made time and divided it into day and night. God outlined the road to salvation and gave people joy and God took endless time away from the people. Four, creation. God created beings to lead people in obedience to her. The red god, Zuchulbara. The yellow god, Lobsalvith. Many gods and angels. Finally, God set out to create paradise, where people would be happy just by being there. Five, promise. But there God's strength ran out, and she collapsed. All the world's people grieved this unfortunate event, yet God breathed her last. She returned to the dust, promising to come again. Six, faith. So God hasn't been lost. We must offer our prayers and not forget our faith. We wait in hope for the day when the path to paradise will open will be opened. And if you look at the ground in the portrait here, there's like that oval oval shaped opening which we're going to see uh, as we approach the final boss fight. So that's essentially what leads up into the cult's current line of beliefs, where they, they believe in Saint Alessa, essentially, being the descent of the Holy Mother, being this never-ending soul that every time she dies returns to the dust. Eventually, she comes back. And whenever she comes back, she's supposed to bring with her paradise. Wasn't there some text in the game that hints at Heather bleaching her hair? 
since she should look like Alessa and Cheryl with black hair. Yes, the very end of the game. Literally part of the ending cutscene. But yeah, she dyes her hair. Normally it is black. I love this map. So this was actually drawn by someone on the devs team, like dev team's actual child. There's a lot of video games that do like the crayon drawing map or like the child drawn map. They do stuff like that in uh, Homecoming later on, Silent Hill Homecoming and a bunch of other games kind of do that trope. The best thing about this one is that a kid actually drew it. Now, there, there was like an actual team artist that did the map portion, but the, the writing of the word chapel, uh, the sun, the house, the bunny, all of the actual stuff around it, uh, the creases in the paper, the fingerprints and smudges all over it, uh, that's, all, that's all like real. They, they had their kid draw these, these bits of artwork and then incorporated the map into it. So it looks more authentic. Because it is. How nice. People worship Alessa and their faith for being an immortal goddess. Why was she shunned and bullied all the time? Uh, so, like I've mentioned several times throughout this playthrough, the cult's beliefs have changed drastically over time. So the cult's beliefs 17 years ago, when Alessa was just a child, were very different from how they are and what they are now. More than 17 years ago. That would have been 24... 24 since the splitting of the soul... But yeah. Are you tired now? How many hours in a row? Going for a world record. This is still nowhere near the longest amount of time that I've streamed. Uh, I'm at 16 hours. We just hit 16 hours for the stream. I've literally done a Silent Hill 3 stream back in 2016 that was 27 hours. These are the cult scriptures. They don't look worth reading. Dear God, please forgive me. I know I'll be put to death for the sins I've committed. And I'll go to my death gladly, and with a peaceful heart. But please, grant me just a small piece of your everlasting mercy. Let me see my child once within your golden gates. Deliver me not to hell, but to purgatory. Allow me to atone for my sins there. I'll stand within the very flames of redemption, no matter how they burn me. Forgive me for my wicked act of revenge. And deliver the soul of my poor murdered daughter. Please, also care for the soul of the girl whose life I have taken. God. I am a child, trembling with fear as I stare at death. Soothe my tortured soul with your infinite mercy. Please, forgive me. Guy being worried about the health is exaggerating. Oh, I know. 
This ain't my first long stream. I've been doing this for six years. I got plenty of sleep and ate and exercised and stuff before the stream. I've been taking breaks to stretch and drinking plenty of water. I know how to prep for these. It's okay. I'm used to them. I've been doing these long streams for a long time. What will you do? Forgive you? Don't say anything. It's okay, Flameburger. I'm just I'm just kind of tired, so I don't mean to sound so uh so annoyed about it. That's just the nature of Twitch. Not everybody's going to be here for an entire 16-hour playthrough and, like, pay attention to all of it. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I got to repeat myself. It's just that some things are harder to repeat than others without going into, like, great detail. So I try to do what I can, but I can't repeat everything. say 60 or 16 uh neither six make it stop no we're gonna keep watching we're gonna look at miles o'brien from star trek just stare at us from up there It really looks like him. Hold on. Hold on. I uh I really I really want to pull up an image. For people who don't know Miles O'Brien, Colm Meany. We're just going to let her keep crying for a while. I forgive you. God, just quit crying. Jesus. Suck it up. I forgive you. Your daughter got murdered. Oh. And you killed somebody. Thank you. Who hasn't in this cult? There's nothing more to be said. Good. We're leaving. I have the feeling that there's someone on the other side of this door. But the door is shut tight, and I can't open it no matter how hard I try.
pyramid head on the other side. They kind of have that setup with the radio and the the fence kind of blocking your hallway. But no, it's just a chonker. Double chonker. Is there any in-game consequence to that choice? Not on New Game, but uh, on New Game Plus, if you meet a bunch of other requirements, including making the correct choice uh, for that sequence, it's what you do for the Possessed ending. So that choice will, will influence your ending on subsequent playthroughs. Not on first playthroughs or New Game playthroughs, though. the canon ending UFO ending obviously it's the only one that makes sense with the other Silent Hill games in Silent Hill 1 Harry Mason gets abducted by aliens Silent Hill 2 Harry Mason working with the aliens abduct James Sunderland and Silent Hill 3 James Sunderland Harry Mason and the aliens are all in Heather in Harry's apartment. Heather shows up. She tells him about the crazy day that they had, uh, that she's had, and Harry's pissed off about it. So they get in the spaceship with the aliens, and they go to Silent Hill, and they destroy it. It's the only one with continuity. Silent Hill 4, you fight in the UFO, and Silent Hill 4 was supposed to have a UFO ending. There were actual items that were in the game files that were most likely going to be things for triggering UFO ending, and it was just content that got cut. St. Alessa, Mother of God, Daughter of God. This picture, that's me. Just like Harry, when he sees Alessa's sketchbook and he's looking at the picture that Cheryl drew of him. Not Alessa's, but Cheryl. He's just like Harry. I'm holding the baby. And... I'm the baby being held. The me that wanted death and disappeared with God 17 years ago. And the me here and now that sought life. Yeah. This is essentially just a painting representation of how Silent Hill 1 ended with good or good plus ending Alessa's souls reunited God gets forced out and killed and before Alessa dies she reincarnates gives the baby to Harry St. Jennifer, unwavering faith under death's blade. St. Nicholas, miraculous hands, a doctor of God. I wonder who these two are supposed to represent. If this is Alessa, 
Saint Jennifer and Saint Nicholas. Santa Claus. <laughs> Obviously it's Santa. Good old Saint Nick. Kaufman? I don't feel like Kaufman would get a place in their religion. He wasn't even a member of the cult. Jennifer Carroll? Ah, persecuted by the Christians. That's actually more possible than a lot of things. Mug Monster. Good catch. Didn't even make that connection. There's a picture here of an angel flying into the heavens. Nothing special. I get the feeling there's something behind this picture, though. That girl's cries and footsteps disappeared beyond it, after all. Will you move the picture of the angel? All right, nobody move. Baltiel dropped a contact lens. You know it's around here somewhere. Just be careful where you step. Altiel doesn't even have eyes. Shh. That's why he lost the contact. Don't make it any any more difficult for him than it has to be. Very sensitive about his no eyes. sound like some kind of unwanted pest. Well, who are you anyway? Haven't you realized that yet? Yeah, you're on Claudia's side. I told you not to put me in the same category as that mad woman. Well, you're pretty loony yourself. It's true. We believe in the same God. But I'm quite sane. So why did you help me out then? Was that also part of trying to resurrect God? It's not uncommon for people to worship the same God and still disagree. God? Are you sure you don't mean devil? Whichever you like. The point is that now I really am on your side. I don't want God to be born. Wouldn't be... convenient. Much too unpredictable. So you've been using me to stop Claudia, is that it? Do your own dirty work. My dirty work? I think we both had our own interests in mind. You hate her too, don't you? You're the only one who can get it done. I don't have powers like you two. Besides, I always hated getting all hot, sweaty. Oh, really? I'm just looking out for myself. Everyone does it. <laughs> Don't stand there looking so smug. You're the worst person in this room. You 
come here and enjoy spilling their blood and, and listening to them cry out. You feel excited when you step on them and snuff out their lives. Are you talking about the monsters? Just a joke. By the way, I forgot to ask you. Did you get the seal of Metatron? What's that? You don't have it? Leonard was carrying it. You mean this thing? Yes, that's it. As long as we have that, we're fine. Here, take this. Otherworld Laws. Look like monsters to you, so they don't look like monsters to him. So it's a reference to Silent Hill 2, and he literally follows it up saying it's, it's a joke. It's a prank. If you as a Silent Hill fan think that he was legitimately talking about the monsters not being monsters, you basically fell for Vincent being like, they look like Bofa to you? Like, you fell for it. They're monsters. That said, it's a bit of a reference to Silent Hill 2. In Silent Hill 2, that game is very much about the perception of reality being different from person to person. They go out of their way to express that characters are not seeing the same things as everyone else. But that's a very unique concept to Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill 1, Harry Mason runs into Kaufman. They see a dead air screamer on the floor. They're both seeing the same monster. Sybil, Thalia, all of them, they all see the same things because they're all experiencing a nightmare coming from Alessa. Silent Hill 3, the nightmare is coming from Alessa basically again. The god growing inside of Heather, the reincarnation of Alessa. So since there's a focal point that the, ni that the nightmare is coming from, Everyone's experiencing it the same. Where do the monsters come from? The town, Heather's mind, the cult. The town, but not necessarily the town itself. There's a spiritual power that just exists in the area where the town was built. And that town can go inside anybody's mind if you are in its range of influence it can go inside your mind it can take things that you believe in and make those things real it can manifest them into reality and shape reality around those things so that's where the other world comes from it's where the nightmare comes from it's where the monsters come from all these monsters represent various aspects things that Alessa or Heather uh, fear and then present those things, manifest them into physical forms.
big old book. I love that description. A big old book I got from Vincent in the archives. There it is. Seal of Metatron. This magic square with strong protective and dispelling properties is called the Viren Seven Crest or the Seal of Metraton. <laughs> Even the game spells it wrong, so don't worry about it. It's Megatron. It's fine. It will bring results regardless of whether the target is good or evil. Its strength, therefore, places a very high burden on the caster. As it is also difficult to control, it is not usually used. This is why it bears the name Metraton after the angel Metatron, or Metraton, also known as the Agent of God. So now we're in essentially nowhere, like the nowhere equivalent of this game. In Silent Hill 1, it's this big amalgamation of all the areas just sort of nonsensically connecting. You're one, one second you're in Alcamilla Hospital, and then you go through a door, and then you're in Midwich Elementary, and, you know, kind of jumping around with all this all these areas sort of connected to each other in ways that don't make sense. So now we're at that point of the game where reality is sort of breaking so drastically that all these areas are sort of m merging together. So we've got one second we're in the church. Now we're back in Heather's apartment. And the bed where Harry Mason's body was left. There's just a blood stain, blood all over the floor. And it's not really like footsteps or anything. It's almost as if somebody came in and like took his body. There's a musty diary on the bed. This writing. Is this dad's diary? Why would it be here? I sometimes have the sense, even now, that that girl is a reincarnation of Alessa. I don't worry about it much now. That's all forgiven. You were unloved, Cheryl. Or was that Alessa? Now Cheryl is Alessa again. No matter whose reincarnation she may have been, that girl was my most beloved treasure. But that name was a mistake. At the time, I thought of her only as a replacement for my lost Cheryl. When she knows the truth, will she feel bad? That's what worries me. Thanks, Dad. So I was Alessa after all. But I do have just a trace of one more memory left. I haven't forgotten my sweet and gentle mother. I've thought about that quote. That's another one of those ones that I feel could technically be taken in two different interpretations. She's talking about her, her sweet mother. She could be talking about that sincerely and referring to Jody Mason, Harry's wife. Or she could be saying it sarcastically in reference to Dahlia Gillespie.
door is open. Inside, there's someone wrapped in a bag. Maybe... No. They're definitely dead. Hangman tarot card. Corpse wrapped in some vinyl-type bag. This crazy mixed-up world has got me used to the strangest things. Easy for me to say. They're still totally disgusting. I feel like I'm going to go crazy myself sooner or later. I might even already be crazy. Who knows? Oh, you fuck. Can anyone confirm or deny my guess? Uh, what guess? Metatron is actually the voice of God people hear when they experience miracles, am I right? Assuming because a human cannot comprehend the Jewish gods whose name is not okay to say voice. I mean, in actual religious mythology, you are accurate. In fictional Silent Hill mythology, the Metatron as far as the cult is concerned is like the seal of Metatron is something else entirely the Metatron itself is something else entirely the cult borrows names and archetypes from existing religions and then sort of amalgamates them into their own beliefs so a lot of times they'll borrow names and concepts and things from Judaism, from Buddhism, from Christianity, from Catholicism, and then give them entirely different sorts of meanings and symbolism. Yell choking the shit out of that nurse. Poor Fukuro lady. Ain't you got better stuff to do? Ah, another familiar Silent Hill 1 room. I wish the whole second half of this game would have just been Silent Hill 1 locations, but done in... PS2 graphics the power like this. Of money that you view with such scorn. Yo. Miracle, thank you so much for the 1244. Thanks for the dance party earlier and the always outstanding analysis. No problem. Thanks for sticking it out with me while uh, my brain melts and the last part of this playthrough kind of goes off the deep end. It's just what happens when I get tired. And the playthroughs go on for this long. But I'm glad you're enjoying it. Thank you so much for the support. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Got a brass key. Some things to look at. Lots of things to look at in this room. Alessa's butterfly collection. And the broken part where we find the key. Possibly a little reference to the float stinger boss that is fought in Silent Hill 1, which is why that's missing. We have another notepad here. The last save point in Silent Hill 1, right before the final boss. Again, in Silent Hill 1 saving the game is Harry just using notepads and writing down his experiences but he doesn't uh, you never get to read what he writes down as a player in Silent Hill 1 
But in three, we get to revisit this stuff and see what Harry wrote. A memo book. Something's written inside. She's just beyond this door. I don't know how, but I can sense it. But she's not the only one there. I sense the presence of something extremely dangerous, even sickening, or maybe what they call God. Nevertheless, I will open the door. Enough of this idle chit-chat. God, I'm not, but I fully intend to save her. No, them. The last entry was written some 17 years ago. Looks like Dad wrote this, too. My clothes from when I was seven. They don't fit me now. Good thing, too. See, things like that when she says, from when I was seven, and she's referring to her life as Alessa when Alessa was seven. Not when, like, she herself, as Heather was, that age. The scribbling on the floor here is Alessa's. For some reason, she always drew monsters like this when she was alone. She used to draw with Claudia, too. A nice daddy and mommy and fun school. A happy world where everyone smiled and laughed all day long. In short, everything we never had. And if you look at the drawing for the monster, it resembles the air screamers. Or actually, with this you can see the texture a lot better. It more resembles Baphomet like Samael, the final boss of Silent Hill 1. The books. The shelves are jammed with books. The top shelf has books on religious teachings and textbooks. Serious stuff. The other two shelves are full of fairy tale books, like Oz and Alice. Here's Mother Goose and Cinderella. I used to love these. So things like that, manifesting themselves from Alessa's mind, her favorite fairy tales, into a lot of the puzzles and items and themes that we see. Uh, a little bit of in Silent Hill 3, mostly in Silent Hill 1. This is a closet. It's meaningless to me. I don't have time to wax nostalgic over these old clothes. Damn. There are playing cards on the floor. I used to play a lot. I remember little Claudia always had a hard time winning. That made her cry. I used to take these dolls with me when I went to bed. Scarlet and... Damn, I forgot the other one's name. In fact, I don't even know which one is Scarlet. Homecoming borrows this concept. Homecoming has a doll named Scarlet. I... no, it wasn't me. Alessa wrote this a long time ago. That chapel altar. It wasn't that one beautiful chapel. It was some other altar somewhere else. Alright. Got those two tarot cards. I've got the key. Yeah, she'll look and comment at everything else, but uh, going through that old closet, looking at the old clothes, just that's where she draws the line. There's Valtiel, spinning that valve.
representing that cyclical nature of impregnation, birth, death, reincarnation. And right above him, the two pairs of legs, supposed to be representing Alessa and Cheryl. Heather's previous lives. What do you mean by Vartile? Valtiel. It is the name of this creature spinning this valve. Silent Hill 1, Alessa's basement room uh, underneath Alcamilla Hospital. <laughs> There's something stuck in this book. Got the Fool tarot card. I feel like I have to read it, but at the same time, I don't want to. A Glophitus. So a Glophitus played a big role in uh, Silent Hill 1. And Heather's about to use it coming up in a little bit here. A Glophitus. A Glaupahotus. Red liquid or crystals resembling blood. According to the Kabbalah, the name is taken from an herb with the power to dispel evil spirits. It is said to grow in Arabian deserts. It may be vaporized or applied as a poultice to guard against demons. It is powerful, but as it is rare, it is extremely difficult to obtain. Uh, Harry got some. Kaufman got two whole fucking bottles of it. Rare but not impossible. It's a picture of me when I was seven. I look bored and sad. Fucking relatable. Well, of course I do. I was always like that back then. <laughs> 24 years ago, Ma Dahlia used me to summon God. God was in my womb, but I couldn't deliver her. Then I was shut up here in this hospital room. I stayed here until Dad helped me out when I was 14. God ate away at me from within, driving me mad with suffering. There I was, wishing I could just die and be done with it. But I went on living that nightmare for seven years. Looking at this bed just reminds me of those awful days. And I don't want to remember them, because I'm not Alessa anymore. But Alessa is still me. I'm really not trying to deny it or anything. I just don't want to remember. Get me out of here. All right. We're going. We're leaving. Okay. Breaking the fourth wall? I mean, a little bit, but 
it's also just kind of her internal monologue. It's almost like she's trying to will herself into just leaving the room. But from a literal standpoint, like you as the player are in control of her, and it's almost like she's she's asking you as a player, like, get me out of here. I don't want to be here. Love the burning animated effects and textures in this game. Blood or burning? I mean, it does kind of look like kind of a combo of both. It'd be seen as like blood rushing through veins. Or fire sort of burning upwards. More Silent Hill 1. Oh, oh no. I'm falling asleep. I need the power of Wolf. Go, High Priestess card. The name Claudia Wolf is written very small on the cover. Looks like this is her diary. November 10th. She didn't die then. She was born. I knew that for a fact. But then why haven't I found her yet? They were supposed to need her power to build paradise for the happiness of the people. She was supposed to be reborn for that. I'd really like to see her. November 14th. Read the Book of Praise. I want to thank Father for lending me such an invaluable book. I found what I'd been searching for in there. How to awaken God. But it's much too cruel. Will I be able to pull it off when I see her? November 16th. I was free all day, so I read A Modern History of Refugees and Young Slaves' Child Exploitation. I guess some nice light-hearted reading material. I don't want to be a mere bystander in this world. I can't do anything now, though, and that's what's hard. There's an old birthday card on the desk, but she was still hanging on to this. Happy birthday. To little Claudia, happy sixth birthday. I love you as if you were my real sister. Here's to you. So Alessa and Claudia were pretty, uh, pretty close, but Claudia's like... She starts looking into like all the evils all the horrible things in the world and it's what starts driving her decision towards like we need to birth a god that will just completely purify the world with fire basically just kill everything Start over. Fresh planet. All the true believers will go to paradise anyway, as far as she believes. Go home. Drop dead. Thief. See, Gothric, I did it. 
This used to be Alessa's. I mean, this was my desk once upon a time. Also a note from Kim Gordon, the teacher. And the lead singer of Sonic Youth. There's a ratty old notebook on the podium. Oops. And there's a letter stuck in here, too. Let's see. There's a girl named Alessa in my class. If your memory is any good, you may remember her. She's the one I said they called a witch. Most likely her mother is abusing her. I've never seen her come in without some sort of scrape or bruise. Her expression is pitifully dark for a six-year-old. Something like this may not be so uncommon. Rather than coming up with pointless ideas, it's best, to, it's best just to watch and wait. But isn't there something I can do to help? I'm considering consulting a lawyer, but I do have my reservations. Why, I thought I'd ask you, my friend, for your opinion first. Hey, Gordon. So many good callbacks to Silent Hill 1. Ow. High Priestess, Hangman, Moon, Fool, Eye of Night. Where was Eye of Night? How do I always miss one tarot card? Rude. Take it. You might backtrack and listen to that. There are a bunch of papers in this file. I get the feeling that it's a handwritten copy of some book. It represents the deity known as the Halo of the Sun. In heraldry, symbolizes a religious group. The two outer circles are charity and resurrection. The three inner circles are present, past, and future. So this symbol that we keep seeing, the save point all the way throughout the game, represents resurrection past present and future all sort of about this convergence the resurrection of Alessa leading up to now the events of the past setting up for the events in this game it's what the symbol has meant the whole time usually drawn in red occasionally drawn in black or other colors but blue reverses the meaning into a curse on God and is therefore forbidden. wrong with blue I don't know but God does not approve all right let me run around a little bit I missed a card somewhere wasn't this one This one, that's Hanged Man. Does it say anything about the color yellow? The Silent Hill wiki says blue and yellow invoke a curse on God. Anything confirming that, or is that wiki being wiki? I think the yellow color thing might come from one of the Western games, or 
supplemental material, like the Book of Lost Memories. I don't think it's mentioned anywhere in this game. Damn. Why you gotta be like that? We got the one out of the book. She anyway, it's like a nightmare. We can see a lot of rooms from Silent Hill One. It's um, it's an area that in Silent Hill One is referred to as nowhere. It's just like a lot of places from memory all smashed together. Get out of my way! Come on. Did I get the fucking card from the church, from the podium? Nope. That's the one I forgot. save. monsters just ignore Claudia and Vincent I can't really say much for Vincent Claudia has shown that she's got some influence over things she has some element of power as well and uh, you know she's like able to control the missionary that killed Harry So she can probably prevent them from attacking her. But yeah, for Vincent, I I can't say. There's there's no reason that they'd be leaving him alone. All right. Last puzzle of the game. This is my sketchbook from 17 years ago. On the front cover here is a picture of dad. Really awful work. What's this doing here? I had a dream. In my dream, I opened a door. But was that really me? I had a different name. 
Watch out. A gap in the door. I'm sure the only me is me. Are you sure the only you is you? So, we have a 3x3 three three grid, each with six letters. And the whole point of the puzzle is to remove any of the letters that won't form a, uh, a set of Roman numerals. So, the top left is 2. Uh, top middle is 22, XXII. Um, after that is XI, or XII. Could be 12, 11 or 12. Uh, left middle would be XX for 20. Oh, sorry, Invariable. Yeah, XVII. 17. Uh, the middle, which is nothing and the letters themselves are n o t h n g practically spelling nothing so it's just zero which is one of the tarot cards that we've got right side is x v i i i 18 Bottom left is XII. That's 12. Bottom middle, XXII. Wait, am I being stupid again? Is that middle one an I? Is that 23? I think it's 23 because there's already 22 up top and then bottom right is XI for 11 so five are true and four are lies and there are some fibs mixed in with the truth that's because it's scary to write only the truth but dreams dreams are like lies after all Sees a 100 in Roman numerals? Yeah, but we're not counting. We're not counting larger denominations. It's just ones, fives, tens. Because our tarot cards only go up so high. So we have the High Priestess, which is two. That's in the top left. The Hanged Man, which is 12, in the bottom left. The Moon, which is 18, that's on the right middle. Fool, which is zero, which is in the very center. And the Eye of Night is 22 uh, in the top middle. Yes, this is hard riddles.
Is Eye of Night the same as the world? Eye of Night is a fictional tarot card made up for this puzzle. It doesn't have a real tarot card equivalent. My priestess in the top left. Moon on the right. I have knight in the top middle. Hanged man in the bottom left. And fool in the center. I want to save after doing the puzzle because I am going to be showing a game over right here. Um, someone wanted to see, someone asked if there's an ending where God is just born and the world ends. And there is, it's technically a game over but it kind of counts as an ending. Magnum, yeah. So that's gonna happen after this cutscene. What do I want? Well, for the two of you to die, that would be nice. Then I could relax. When did you stop believing in God? God lives. Just look around you. But I do believe in her. In my own way. I fear her, and I adore her. But I haven't lost my mind like you. You think that this is the work of God? Isn't this all nothing more than your own personal nightmare? Just like Alessa 17 years ago? If this really is the work of God, then I'd say she has lousy taste. You mock God? Traitor. You will go to hell. Not that again. Who do you think you are claiming to know God's will? Go home, Vincent. Home? This church is my home. I built it with my power. The power of money that you view with such scorn. Although, I admit that this atrocious scenery is all yours. If you continue to get in my way, of honor has arrived. Let's get this party started. Heather, go ahead and kill this crazy bitch. This demon who claims to speak for God. The time has come. You can kill her now. You go to hell! Important. You're not going to run? I guess this is the end. No, the beginning. As Vincent said, the time has come. Alessa, I'm saddened that you didn't agree to this on your own. But I thank you for nurturing God with all the hate in your heart. It's time for 
for mankind to be released from the shackles of sin which bind them. But a god born from hatred can never create a perfect paradise. Happy people can be so cruel. Is it so hard to believe that sympathy could be born out of pain and suffering? Why do you reject God's mercy? Why do you cling to this corrupt world? You know that only God can save us. And save you too? Happy ending? feel so guilty about it. Why don't you go to hell? Heather, use the seal. Vincent? The seal of Metatron? Now your stupid dream is over. Oh, that's just a piece of junk. What do you think you can do with that? Do you really think it can kill God? I'm sorry to see you fell for my father's foolishness. What? You're pathetic. Yeah. Shut it. Oh shit, I missed. Shut it. Hold on, I gotta reload. Shut up. So yeah, if you try to attack Claudia in any way, 
the whole time the god has been growing inside of Heather because of feeding off of negative emotions. You give in to revenge, Heather's anger. You give in to that revenge. The god finally has fed enough. And it begins to be born. You fucked up. You fucked up and gave in to the negative emotions and fed God. And now God's being born. So that's what happens if you just attack Claudia. That's your God is born and life as we know it ends. Vincent, are you okay? Vincent's dead. I hated him too, but it doesn't mean this makes me happy. Why couldn't I have stopped Claudia? Yeah, why didn't you? I had lots of time. And a katana. There's no reason that you didn't. Well, we've been carrying this since the very beginning of the game. The pendant that Dad gave me on my birthday. One of my treasured belongings. There's a jewel inside like a little red tablet. A Galophitus demon repellent. We're about to abort this god fetus. Looks like God didn't make it. Stop! God is... Claudia!
I love how in the widescreen mods, uh, as well as on like the HD collection, because of the widescreen, you can just see like Claudia's legs poking out of the hole. That's a booty hole. Vincent has run away. Yeah, Vincent's just gone. Just absolutely gone. No, Outcast Joe. Only a small number. Kinda. Swing. No, this is the PC version with widescreen mods. HD collections, shit, so I almost never stream that version. Unless I'm making a point of how terrible it is. She doesn't swipe immediately on normal action. It's so weird. The god does not have a set appearance. It's based on whoever births it and what they believe. In the first game, Alessa was very strictly raised to believe that, you know, it had the Baphomet-based appearance. So that's what it winds up looking like. For Claudia, she influences it for its form here. She believes in Saint Alessa, so it resembles Alessa. This technique only works for PC. It kind of works on PlayStation 2. It's not as consistent. Because it's like a frame rate thing. There's another safe spot that you can do with the mall on PS2. But the technique with the katana that I just used pretty much just works on PC. Dad. <laughs> That's it, by the way. GG. Nice 17 and a half hour stream. Just like Silent, Silent Hill 2. I'm gonna die for the next day. I'll probably wind up taking tomorrow off at this, this rate. So Silent Hill 4 might be delayed by a day, but it's okay. We'll still get to all the games. If it takes us this week, if it takes us an extra couple days, we'll get to it.
machines. Thank you for the bits. Very much appreciate it. Sewer. Thank you for that prime sub. Over. Not yet. You're still alive. Heather. What the? What? Heather. Oh. <laughs> oh. Just a joke. <laughs> You've got terrible taste. I'm sorry. <laughs> Heather, did you? You don't have to call me that. I'm not hiding anymore. You want me to use your real name? What was it again? Cheryl. The name my father gave me. And that's why she's called Cheryl in Dead by Daylight. Go back to? I don't know. Don't you think blondes have more fun? She also has an alternative costume with her original black hair color.
Ah, the wonders of in-game time. And a whole lot of large sections of the game where the timer is paused. 10 hours and 5 minutes in-game time. 17 and a half hours real time. But hey. Silent Hill 4 when? I, at some point. I try to do these, like, the day after, but I've just been awake for 25 hours, streaming for 17 of those. Uh, so forgive me if I'm not back in six hours and jumping on Silent Hill 4. Um, I might skip a day and then get to SH4 on Tuesday. Um, thanks you guys so much for all the love and support. Really appreciate, uh, everybody being by, hanging out, checking out the stream. If you've just been, uh, hanging out in chat, keeping me company, asking questions, joining me in conversation. Uh, if you've just been lurking, chilling in bed, listening in the background while you work, while you sleep... It means just as much to me that you choose uh, to have my stream as your background noise. Seriously, it's an honor. I uh, I listen to background streams and stuff whenever I'm doing anything else, so it means a lot to me that, that you would choose me even for that. Seriously, much love to everybody. I hope uh, I hope everybody has a great week. As said, I'm uh, I'm not too sure exactly when I will be back, but definitely this week doing some Silent Hill 4 and might take a little bit longer than originally planned, but we'll get through uh, all of the si main Silent Hill games within the next week or so. New Game Plus. We got a Beam Saber. We got an unlimited machine gun. We got extra costumes. Happy birthday. There we go. So that's Silent Hill 3, everybody. It kind of fell apart there at the end. I said I just got tired and delirious. We had a dance party and... Uh, yeah, no. We'll we'll revisit all of these. It's not the first time that I've streamed these super long, in-depth, you know, playthroughs. Definitely won't be the last, and I try to cover different stuff every time I do it, so. Hope everyone enjoyed. I'm gonna get some sleep. Let me, uh... Let's see. So I'm going to go and raid my friend KZ Fru. Or am I? Please tell me you're still going. Okay. I'm going to raid my friend KZ. Uh, a lot of you may have seen him through GDQs. He's a absolutely legendary Grand Theft Auto speedrunner and uh, just a super cool person. I've had the pleasure of meeting him and hanging out with him several times. So drop by, give him a follow if you like some Grand Theft Auto speedruns and stuff. He's your dude. Show KZ some love, and I will see you all next time. Take it easy, y'all. Peace.